Tonight, last night, we started with a, the general overview of the revenue forecast for the upcoming fiscal year 19 budget uh, by Mr. Dunkley, our chief financial officer. Then we had the, the departments that are categorized as the organizational capacity departments, and those departments are the ones that support the operating departments that actually uh, implement the strategic plan of this city commission uh, that you'll see tonight and tomorrow night. And just quickly, uh, in case you're wondering what is up on the screen, this it will be the proposed organizational chart for the city of Deerfield Beach. We are moving away from your typical governmental bureaucratic nonsense of a rigid organization to focus not on departments, but to center, put the citizens in the center of everything we do, which is quality of life, safety and readiness, prosperity for businesses, as well as for residents, sustainability and infrastructure, and of course, the organizational capacity to support those four uh, core st uh, strategic goals set by the city commission. The reason why we've done this is, again, not only do we want the, the citizenry to be at the center of everything, but we also are pushing in to get rid of this departmental um, silo mentality that has hurt the city for the past several decades. And we don't want any of our tribe members to just focus on they work in ocean rescue or they work in parks and recreation, we want them to focus that they're there for safety and readiness or to improve the quality of life of citizens. So this just isn't a symbolic uh, chart. This is actually going to be the culture that city commission came up with during the strategic plan and implementing it throughout the city. So with that, um, Mayor Gans, if I could introduce the assistant city manager who will be responsible for the quality of life and prosperity uh, responsibilities. Uh, actually, before we do that, yeah, it's sure. all right just to explain for those who might not have been here last night from the public, uh, the budget workshop itself that we're having is a little different than what we've had in the past. This isn't a wish list being presented by the department heads. Um, with budget, with uh, cuts made later by the, and recommendations made later by the city manager. At this point right now, these presentations and what's being presented is part of the recommend, which will be the recommended budget by the city manager. Is that accurate? Yes, that is correct. So that is a little bit of a different change than what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So the numbers that we hear tonight is what would be presented to us. Um, unless there are some changes based on what this work comes out of this workshop. Uh, what we'll do at the end of the meeting, uh, based on the itinerary, is we will have public input at that point, in which people can come up and uh, speak on any of the items that are discussed here tonight. So uh, I think we've tried to stall and wait enough, long yeah. enough for uh, Commissioner Drosky, so we've got to let you move forward. That, that's all right. Just uh, one other thing, we are videotaping uh, tonight's public workshop like we did last night and tomorrow night. So if you did, weren't here last evening or if you can't make it tomorrow evening, they will be available later this week <coughs> online as will the presentations be available. Uh, oh. And just, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. and just one other key point from last night. I didn't realize that's what you wanted me to discuss, but we will not receive the final revenue estimates uh, from the property appraiser until July 1st, give or take, and then from the state of Florida till somewhere between July 15th and July 30th. So expenditures, as I indicated last evening, they, uh, right now, this is what I'm recommending, but if revenues come in lower than what's been forecasted, then I'll have to make those adjustments to bring forward a, re a balanced recommended budget. If it goes higher, um, which we think, uh, if it were to do that, it would only be slight. So we'd probably just bring that forward to go into the fund balance at this point. Okay. And, and just a reminder to the public, please turn off your cell phones, silence them. You could. And we do have refreshments over there for all of you in the corner. And with that, I'm sorry. I no, that's, no, that's okay. So uh, with that, if it would please the uh, city commission, I'll have Ms. Petty do an overview 
of prosperity and quality of life and how we're going to stitch that together to make it, the city of Deerfield Beach more than just another municipality in South Florida. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioner, Kara Petty, City Manager. Can you speak into the mic sure. a little louder, sir? Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Tonight we will be discussing the future plans for the departments and divisions that are within the prosperity and quality of life sectors of the strategic plan. The departments collectively work to unify the city as a place to work, live, and play. Planning and development services and building and inspection services lay the groundwork for enhanced and responsible development. This is achieved in numerous ways, including progressive codes, land use and zoning changes, streamlined planning and building processes, which result in long-term quality, a variety of housing stocks, and a viable business base. Code compliance seeks to ensure that properties continue to abide by the various codes put in place so the city remains high in curb appeal. Economic development then puts on the muscle. Creative retail strategies are used to recruit, retain, and expand business in order to further develop the city's revenue base. The focus for economic development is quality instead of quantity. We seek to have diverse business opportunities that meet the various communities' needs and unique character throughout the city. As we know, each neighborhood has their own little niche and their, their identity, so we want to make sure that we keep that part of Deerfield Beach. The goal is to attract employers and ultimately have their employees reside within the city, thus reinvesting in it. To that end, quality educational opportunities are the number one priority for employer recruitment. Unfortunately, the Broward County School Board does not seem to place enough emphasis on its public schools located in the northeastern portion of the county. Um, community development will continue to work with the board to ensure that city schools are a priority, but will also continue to look at other options such as charter schools. They will also continue their outreach to low-income residents to assist with home repair and first-time home buyer opportunities. Once the residents are here, the focus is on a good quality of life so that prosperity stays within the city limits. It is our desire as a government to provide our residents and visitors with an abundance of thriving, beautiful green space in order to enrich their lives. We believe this philosophy starts in parks and grows in parks. Every season of life should experience quality recreational activities, especially our senior community and our Center for Active Aging is where life continues to happen through the golden years. Once the circle of life is completed, we respectfully provide end-of-life services in one of our city cemeteries. Parks and recreation and active aging should really be seen as one entity to city residents due to their similarities. Thus, the departments have been actively working together to provide programming. With over 100 days of events, various other programming, and healthcare, the departments have something for everyone in our diverse community. There is an overarching value of community outreach and assistance, promotion of health and wellness, as well as an investment into the educational development of both our youth and adults. To further this, we plan to utilize various community partnerships with entities such as Broward County and higher education institutions such as Nova Southeastern University to provide recreational and educational programming and opportunities, especially of the marine-based mind. Um, from quiet waters all the way to the beach. We envision the city as a place to be able to go from east to west, vice versa, and be able to stop all along the way for a lot of recreational activities um, throughout our, our city. And we no longer think of boundaries such as districts, city, or county. Whereas boundaries divide us, we believe collectively providing services to one community as a whole will work towards uniting us. And with that, if I may call up Chris Mori, Director of Economic Development. Sure. But the record could show that uh, Commissioner Drosky is right. Vice Mayor and members of the City Commission. My name is Chris Mori. I'm the Director of Economic Development. To my left, I'm pleased to introduce you to Gigi Chazu. She's our uh, 
uh, economic development coordinator, and we're very pleased to have her on staff. Um, I'm pleased that she could be here this evening. Thank you. Uh, the city manager mentioned I'm not feeling all that well, but I'm hoping my meds will get me through at least this presentation. <coughs> The Department of Economic Development is a fairly new department in the city framework, uh, but I hope that you'll agree by the end of this presentation that we've got off uh, to a great start. We are running fast, and um, as the assistant city manager said, we really do have a lot of muscle in what we do, and uh, I hope that you'll agree that we have a big impact on the city. The Economic Development Department is responsible for business attraction, retention, and expansion. And what does that mean? Of course, bringing new businesses to the community. But once they're here, keeping them here, keeping them happy, making them part of our fabric. And if they're happy, hopefully they'll then expand. With the expansions, of course, is job creation as well as through attraction. So job creation is a big uh, goal of ours as well. Along with that, and getting to the theme of prosperity, this tax base expansion. Last night you heard from the property appraiser um, about uh, you know their role, but um, the, the economic development department plays a very key role in expansion of the tax base, and we take it very seriously. Literally, up by a property by property basis, we look at the properties and see what we can do to maximize income, so that we can bring in revenue to provide services for the community. We're responsible for overall business climate enhancement. And what that means is that when businesses interact with the city, we want them to have a five-star experience. We want them to feel uh, important. We want them to feel relevant. Um, and more often than not, we want them to go on and do their business and have the city be as accommodating when need be, but as out of sight when need be. <coughs> Our staff, of course, is quite small, but we um, consult with <coughs> hundreds of businesses throughout the year, um, from large businesses like JM Family all the way down to mom and pop restaurants. They all have needs. All those needs are different, and we try to service them as, as well as we can. Um, there's never um, two days in economic development that are exactly the same. And of course, all this goes together to enhance the quality of life. We feel that by having a vibrant business community, good employers, good jobs for the people that live here, um, that that enhances our quality of life. Later on, we'll talk about our economic development strategy and how that's a really important thing that we're working on to improve in 2019 and years in the future. Of course, we undertake marketing and CRA management. Our community redevelopment agency is also under this department. But we won't cover that tonight because uh, that's a CRA group uh, meets separate from city commission. So um, I want to talk to you briefly about some uh, of the first accomplishments that we've made now as a new department. I'll take you through each of these separately. <coughs> this year we uh, entered into a contract with a consulting firm called Retail Strategies, Inc. They are a, a nationally renowned firm that specializes in just that retail strategy. Uh, one of the things that the city suffers from is um, a lack of good quality retail uh, businesses <coughs> along some of our major corridors. And so we're working with uh, retail strategies to come up with some, first of all, baseline information about our retail market. What do we have? What are we missing? Uh, where are the opportunities? To look at what's called retail leakage, to find out where consumers who have a, a dollar to spend in Deerfield Beach are taking their money, um, and instead of spending it here, why are they spending it somewhere else? Also, um, some of these materials you'll see in the future, they're still in development, but the retail um, heat map, where is our market? Who comes to Deerfield Beach? Um, and you know, how do we connect with those people? Um, and then finally, kind of the matchmaking, this is like the match.com of, of retail, right? So this consultant has what they specialize in is relationships. They know the developers of Zaxby's. They know the developers of Olive Garden. They have all these relationships. And so what we hope to get through them is not only the demographic information, but that matchmaking relationship. So in 2019, these are, there are three areas that we will start to really explore more fully. 
Um, as Ms. Petty talked about earlier, housing is going to be a big one of them. Um, you know, it's interesting that the city's economic development strategy focuses on two very important things, housing and education. Not typically areas that you would see in an economic development strategy, but one that we have to address um, and will work on in 2019. And also in 2019, we anticipate working with a lot more multi-family uh, residential developers. Um, there's been a, more of a trend towards that this year, and economic development staff participates in that as part of the tribe with um, planning, uh, with Eric Powers' team, and with uh, community development as well. So I just thought I'd take you through a little bit of, this. I'll go through this quickly. Um, in terms of retention and expansion, I'll just go through some of these and you can just see some of the names um, that we have in the city. And these are, this is just a sampling of businesses that this department has interacted with uh, so far this year. And as I said, some are big, some are small, but they're all here and they all need assistance. Some need two hours of our time, some need four weeks of our time. In terms of attraction, we've had made some good strides this year as well. And I'll just go through a couple of them. There are some that we're still working on that aren't ready to announce yet, but Crawford Tracy Corporation is new, Old Everglades Distillery, the Learning Experience, Shipmunk, which is literally like right in back of us, well, right behind the Learning Experience, um, Wraith Financial, uh, Broward College we've been working with, the Oxford Group, <coughs> Wawa, everyone's heard of Wawa coming into the city, General Provision, Nova Southeastern. This is just a sampling. Uh, we could, I, I could probably go on for 10 or 15 minutes with logos of companies that we've worked with to bring them into the city this year. And one thing with the addition of Gigi on our staff, we're really pleased. In fact, um, Gigi is, uh, speaks four languages. She's certified in Spanish, and so this department has actually issued its first Spanish language uh, press release when we announced our opportunity zones. So we plan on doing that much more so that we can um, really just be more inclusive um, in the business community. But in terms of technical assistance, uh, we've been working with, these are some of the smaller companies that we've been work with, working with, and I'm sure that, you know, it wouldn't be surprising if you've never ever heard of these businesses, but they're here. Many of them are advanced industries, and by advanced industries, that to me translates into good paying jobs. So one thing that the department has really ramped up on this past year is regional. Actually, this should probably say global marketing because we just don't market the city regionally. Now we go to state trade shows. Um, we, I maximize my membership in the International Economic Development Council um, and things like that. So this year we've made a lot of partnerships. Uh, we are much, much more on the radar screen uh, in the South Florida region than we were at this time last year and we intend on just really, really keeping ourselves um, on the front, forefront of that and very relevant in this region. Um, so actually, Florida Executive Airport is one of the top five fastest growing airports in the United States, and that's a relationship that we hope to mine in this next year. <coughs> of course, uh, Rebecca might talk a little bit more about our interaction with um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Urban Land Institute, the National Association of Industrial and Office Parks. Um, one a group that we've really uh, ramped up our relationship is with the International Council of Shopping Centers. Um, last year I attended, and we're um, getting ready to attend again this year in August. Uh, we'll be traveling to Orlando. Uh, the ICSE Trade Show in Orlando features 5,000 participants, uh, both uh, mostly retailers, but investors and that kind of thing, so we can get Deerfield Beach face-to-face -face with people who represent tenants in um, shopping centers. South Florida Manufacturers Association is a new relationship for us. Another one is the um, Commercial um, Investment uh, uh, Marketing Group. Uh, we've hosted them last year, and we really hope to um, expand on that relationship again this year. The CCIM Group is your top-notch um, commercial brokers in this area, and uh, they really are the movers and shakers of property. They know what's what's available, who's moving, and um, we really need to make that relationship to keep us on the cutting edge of economic development. 
South Florida um, Technology Association. We've been trying to match up uh, some people who are interested in starting up businesses with this group. And um, this logo may not look familiar, but this past year, the uh, uh, Realtors Association of the Palm Beach has joined with Broward County. And uh, we, again, participated in the mayor's breakfast. Uh, the mayor did an excellent job representing the city, uh, this time to the residential realtors of South Florida and the Palm Beaches. We've uh, begun um, a, a membership in a website called Opsites. We've been loading up maps and information on our special districts, Pioneer Grove, Dixie Business Corridor, Four Corners, um, to uh, basically start marketing our districts for to investors and developers. We've only had this um, site live for just over a month. Um, and already in a month, we've gotten contacts, direct contact from 87 new developers and investors, and we've actually um, whittled that down to five real leads. And this is just what the interface on, online looks like if you care to go and look at it yourself. In addition to this, of course, the economic development staff continues to um, cross-train and, and support the other um, departments of the tribe, especially in the area of planning. We participate with Eric's group um, as it relates to um, business district planning and, as I mentioned before, also redevelopment. just want to go through advocacy and special projects um, really quickly. Uh, we continue to staff the county's platinum programming, uh, platinum permitting program. <clears throat> um, and by this program, when um, projects come up that are of a special importance, people can apply for um, expedited permitting, and our staff helps support that. Um, this will actually become relevant um, in the next couple of months as Broward County asks for expedited permitting for 911 telecommunications facilities. We talked previously about tax base analysis. Um, I conduct regular analyses um, in conjunction with the GIS department to look at um, our tax base and to see where things are moving, where things are lagging, um, and to make recommendations to the city manager about policies. FDOT, of course, has been a big one this year in terms of advocacy um, on Southwest 10th Street. This department's been active in uh, assisting the business community to, in, in terms of engagement on Southwest 10th Street. Um, we don't talk about it much, but actually Gigi's been really heading up um, an effort to ramp up the uh, landscaping on I-95, specifically um, at the request of um, the UM Sylvester Cancer Institute to give them some better visibility along I-95. Something that doesn't cost us anything, but it really helps them out a great deal. Um, roadway enhancements in general, and um, working to advocate for wayfinding um, signage verbiage. Um, sometimes when we deal with the state, they don't understand things like the cove, and so we really have to fight to get those kind of names on signs. Also this year, uh, this department did a lot of work researching uh, with FPNL, <clears throat> not just in terms of underground utilities in and of themselves, but on resiliency efforts so that we can help the business community plan and become more resilient and prepared for future um, disasters or storms. Um, one project we've been working on just recently is interacting with the United States Department of um, Economic Development Administration. Um, it's a multi, again, a multi-department uh, effort. We're trying to apply for funds that would be uh, through the EDA for economic development to fund infrastructure, and the infrastructure then would be tied to bringing in new businesses for jobs. We're still um, scoping out that project at this point. We're also going to go back to Broward County. They have a Broward Redevelopment Fund, and we're going to try to scope out a project um, to go after that pot of money as well. Uh, they will have $8 million available this year. And then in terms of affordable housing, um, you know, we really are in startup mode on this. But the one thing I would say about affordable housing as it relates to economic development is this. Right now, the county is trying to um, advance a policy of one size fits all. And I think in Deerfield Beach, one thing is clear is that as it relates to uh, housing in general, affordable housing in particular, one size does not fit all for our community. We are not similar to others. And so that's, this is one area that um, our department will be uh, actively advocating. Oh, I guess I had some little logos for you to look at. Um, so uh, a new funding area this year would be, will be um, a request to fund the newly formed um, Economic Development Council. Uh, this is uh, not a new group. In fact, uh, this group came in front of the City Commission over almost three years ago now. 
<clears throat> in the past to be this voice of the business community um, to advise the commission on matters of interest you know, on, uh, from the business community. This was a group that emanated from the chamber. They've really uh, got, gained some steam now. They are separate from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they are getting um, members on board. Um, Dave Morantz is here. He's the executive director of the group. Uh, the chair of this group is uh, Bob Burbsong from OK Generators. Uh, they have a great group of founding members. <coughs> um, what this group is going to be is a private sector uh, complement to what the city is doing in terms of economic development. By not being in the city, they can operate outside of Sunshine, um, and that's particularly crucial when you're talking about um, private deals that are going on in uh, commercial real estate. Their main goal is to market the city as a premium business destination. Um, and I think what we've already seen coming to the forefront with this group is the spirit of peer-to-peer -peer advocacy. It's one thing if a, a, a business says to another business owner, you know, this is my experience. That wor those words coming from a business owner are much more meaningful sometimes than coming from uh, a government employee like myself. So here we have Dave, Dave Moran. Oh, I, I just uh, forgot to mention this whole fund. Was, uh, this group was started through the uh, generosity of JM family. They provided startup money for this group for, I believe, at least six months. <coughs> um, so finally, I wanted to let you know about some performance measures that we're holding ourselves to. And you can see that some of this, the um, categories up top are new. Um, these are things that we know that in terms of our economic development strategy, we'd like to track in the future, uh, but we're just not, um, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, but we feel that that information will be really good to give back to the commission so you can see your return on investment in this department. <coughs> won't say much more about it except for the numbers keep growing each year. We get busier and busier, uh, but we still maintain a really, I think, a very good level of service. We return phone calls within 24 hours. Um, and we just get really good feedback from the businesses that we assist. Um, so uh, our budget last year um, was $486,000, and this year our budget request is um, $363,000. That's actually not a 25%. It's a 25% change, but it's a negative change. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Commission comments? Questions? Keep up the good work, and thank you for reducing the budget. Yes. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to know what those other two languages are. French, so I can expect to see some brochures or something in Creole or French or whatever. That's the plan, and actually I can work with uh, other languages as well. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, retails, <coughs> it was one of these things that you uh, talked about, Ms. Moore, uh, matchmaking relationships. Uh, are we planning on using that on Dixie Highway. I'm still not satisfied with progress on Dixie Highway, uh, Mr. Power, uh, and I know we have some unique uh, things going on on Dixie Highway, but uh, I've been here four years now, and it's almost time for us to put something in the ground one way or the other. So if we have to take the lead on that, Mr. Manager, uh, we need to do that and quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um, This, did I hear you say that the EDC is going to need funding? Yes, they requested $50,000 in funding. Uh, and I guess then my, my question is to Mr. Sirota, if it's an advisory board, can we give them funding to uh, help with their tasks? I mean, the CRA is, is Distinct and separate from the city. Can you hear me? Not the CRA, the EDC, the Economic Development Committee. And what is the question? You want to provide them with funding? If if they're going to be advisory to the commission, can we give them funds to do that? I guess it would be specific to what purpose the funds are to be used for. We have to look into it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it certainly has to serve a public purpose. That would be a bare minimum. 
Uh, but depending upon what the nature of the use of the funds are, we have to analyze and look at that. And is that $50,000 included in the budget that you're asking for, and we still will achieve the 25% or 23% decrease? So um, just to answer your question, the um, EDC has indicated, submitted a budget to me. They've indicated that they uh, anticipate spending this money on marketing and events. And yes, that money is included in the $363,000 budget, and that is uh, accounted for in the 25% decrease from last year. And these marketing and events are going to be all over the city? Yes. Not just one set. Okay, thank you. <coughs> city Manager. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, the EDC is not uh, an advisory board to the City Commission. They're an autonomous uh, organization that has no ties to the city other than it's a group of business owners or executives that have formed to help uh, expand marketing and uh, business retention and attraction into the city. So it, it's not like you're like we have with the cultural committee or the planning and zoning. So they wouldn't necessarily be an advisory board. They may speak to you individually or to the board as a whole, but they, there's no linkage between city commission, the city of Deerfield Beach as an organization and the Economic Development Council. I just want to make sure that's clear for the public I, I as well. Exactly, because yeah. I heard advisory come and I know that I've talked to the members or some yeah. members of that uh, uh, committee and I didn't get that impression that it was going to be advisory to the board and that's why I asked the question of the uh, yep. Yep. Sorry. Okay, didn't thank you. The yeah, I, I just but, but the city manager <coughs> is absolutely correct. It's a separate, completely independent entity uh, from the city. Thank you. Commissioner Droskic. What did you do to cut in your budget that gave you the, the savings in addition to the 50000 that you added? So um, the, uh, one of the largest decreases was um, actually taken care of by our contract with Retail Strategies. Previously we had thought that the price for this contract was going to be a lot more, but we were able to buy it down by piggybacking on a contract with the, that they've done with other cities. And we've been able to spread it out over three years, so instead of paying $150,000 for it in one year, like we had planned last year, we can amortize it um, over three years. So that was one area. Um, and then also in terms of marketing, because we are um, marketing not just, uh, in previous years we had a separate marketing budget for Pioneer Grove and for Dixie Highway. And um, as Vice Mayor pointed out, we really need to um, <coughs> beef up our efforts for Dixie Highway. Um, so we have lumped those together in, into an overall marketing budget for for redevelopment in those areas. Thank you. Um, can you go back uh, to the slides that show the performance measurements? So you have an FY18 estimate. In other words, this is what you've estimated that you will, will have accomplished or we're hoping to accomplish. Um, that's a formatting here. Um, it should say, there's actually a column missing from what I put in, but um, I apologize. That is the fiscal 18 estimate. There's a column missing where, with fiscal 18 actual. Okay, that would be important to have. I, I apologize for that. Well, well, actually, you would not have an actual at this point because. To date. Yeah, it would be to date. However, that's not an actual number to date. We do the estimate, which we feel is um, on track, um, Mr. Mayor, for the end of this fiscal year. So we feel that that's fairly accurate. It does take year to date into account. However, we felt that doing year to date just did not make sense. We wanted to give you an estimate. And then as we've done in the past, um, you know, because this is a new department, there's not fiscal year 17 tra track um, yet. So next year will be FY18 actuals and then FY19 estimate, FY20 targets. Okay, what, what makes sense to me, if, if, 
say is that while if you want to give an estimate of where you think you're going to be at the end of FY18, you should at least put in there what you've expected to accomplish under FY18. Compare it to what you think you're going to end up so we can know whether or not this makes sense or not. Um, when we get to FY19, we can say this is what our goals are. And then we can figure out the performance measures, we can determine how we perform. So right now, I feel like I have a little bit of incomplete information for me to, to determine you know, our success rate on that. So just, just to know if we could get that information, that would be great. We could have that. Yes, I just want one other question. You talked about housing, <clears throat> and basically, um, for all intents and purposes, Deerfield is built out. We're not getting any more new land. When we talk about housing, what are we focusing on here? Multifamily, or, or what, what are we? So um, what we've seen in this past year is probably going to continue on into the, at least the next year or two before we you know, can anticipate some sort of slowdown. So what we've seen is infill development um, focusing on multifamily. So that's you know, a trend that we see and I, we expect it to continue. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So, thanks. Thank you. Feel better. Just uh, before, as we have the next group, Mr. Power, I believe, yes. coming up. Uh, just quickly, uh, Mary Gans, we hear you on that. So in the budget, we'll actually reflect year to date on the estimate so for the document. And then next year, we'll have year to date if that's really what the city commission would like. So it's not a problem. Yeah, I, I just feel like we're going to have yeah. performance measures. We need to know what we're comparing. It's All great right. to say this is what our goals are, but we need to see what we actually accomplished to know what you're measuring up against. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. All right. Uh, so my name is Eric Bauer. I'm in the Director of Planning Development Services for the City of Deerfield Beach. And uh, with me tonight to uh, my right, your left, is Stephen Graham, our Assistant Director of Planning Development Services. Uh, we also have Bernard Pita, our Code Supervisor. And tonight we have uh, Chris Giordano, who's our Director of Management Services for Calvin Giordano and Associates. Sheila Oliver, our building official, cannot be here tonight. So the city, sorry, excuse me. The department does have a vision statement to plan, facilitate quality development, redevelopment, promote neighborhood sustainability, and facilitate the enhancement of human and natural environment in the city. Uh, we do strongly believe in this statement, and we feel that we represent this statement in everything that we do. The department is made up of three divisions: uh, planning and landscaping, building services, and code compliance. Essentially what the departments do, our primary functions are development review, the DRC process, uh, permitting, code compliance, land development code, comprehensive plan amendments, and in county and state currency, and we are the liaisons to several boards in the city. So some of the, the events that have occurred um, this year, some of the successes and improvements we've had is we did hold a charrette for the DBR zoning. Uh, this is a, to us a very successful event that was held here in this building uh, for the Dang Group and other various stakeholders of the Dixie uh, Highway Corridor. We also created the Phase 1 Pioneer Grove Infrastructure Master Plan. This is a plan that is designed to uh, create the underground uh, ne necessary changes in order to create the dense urban environment that we're looking for in Pioneer Grove. We have uh, utilized uh, new software and new technologies such as City Engine and SketchUp to create many of the new renderings and plans that you've seen. And if you recall from the State of the City event in the video, the design that was made at the end of the video for what Pioneer Grove could look like was made in-house through new software. And uh, we're very proud to announce that the Florida Planning and Zoning Association has uh, given the City of Deerfield Beach an award for design standards for Pioneer Grove for 2018's most outstanding development and design. So um, we're getting some, some statewide recognition for the city. And as you know, we have a few projects already here in Pioneer Grove and we have more coming. So things are, things are progressing. Uh, we've also implemented a cost recovery program for uh, development review. This includes attorney's fees, uh, traffic fees, noise things like that, where development comes forward and instead of the city spending those dollars to do that type of work that, that we don't have the ability to do, 
uh, we require that the developer pay for these consultants to, to, to review the plans. And so that's a process that has saved city dollars, saved taxpayer dollars, um, and we're, we're happy to be able to implement that. Uh, we've had um, major development here in the city this past year, uh, 13 projects this year. Of course, some of the bigger projects you're familiar with, uh, Crystal Lake, JM Family, Deerfield Station, things like that. We've also had major land use plan amendment changes and uh, nine code amendments this past year. We have another one coming in September for development review committee changes. And that's a very large uh, change for us. So that'll, that'll squeak in this fiscal year, but it's not before you yet. Just to kind of show you location-wise where some of these plans have been, they're pretty much all over the city. Uh, the yellow is, uh, right. the yellow is um, uh, light land, I'm sorry, uh, uh, DRC plans, and the blue is uh, land use plan amendments. So these are very large projects in the city that take time. These are things that go before you, city commission for approval. Not all of them have come before you yet, but these, some of these are still in the hopper. And some of the other things that have occurred is that the planning staff um, is working with the Department of Environmental Services and Economic Opportunity to uh, really re-engage um, the MPO, county, and other state agencies in doing the work that is needed to improve the infrastructure of the city. Uh, so uh, before you is um, locations, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the big yellow line, which is 10th Street. But there are other locations here in the city that, that we are trying to improve, which includes not as well as just the Pioneer Grove, which is uh, the green, um, Dixie Highway, um, Third Street or FAU Research Park, uh, Green Road, Crystal Lake, and the Powerline Hillsborough intersection are all uh, major improvements the city is looking to make and we're looking to engage these other agencies to uh, take advantage of their dollars to make these improvements happen. So some improvements and accomplishments that have occurred this year in our building services department, of course, is the change to the building fee schedule, which if you recall, we have simplified the building schedule process, especially for a larger development and making it consistent, uh, making it easier for not just developers, but homeowners to understand uh, the permitting process and make it as transparent as possible. We've also implemented a, a multitude of policy changes, uh, applicant surveys, customer greeters, sign and tracking systems, uh, pre-construction meetings, uh, so forth, to, to help, again, not just the developers, but the homeowners as well in their permitting process. And then additionally, with our code compliance services, some improvements we made this year, as you just recall, at the last commission meeting, uh, we had the second reading for <coughs> changes to the city code, including the standard housing code. We've also done a multitude of policy changes, uh, including uh, changes to our courtesy notice, um, the door hanger program, you know, uh, additional outreach uh, along with our PIO. Uh, we're working on language services uh, for our residents who don't speak English or English isn't their first language. Um, and of course, we work with other departments, not just uh, planning development services. We do multiple outreach and not including crime stoppers, but uh, local other organizations, churches, and so forth to, to get the message out. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the workload that the code compliance has and just to share for a moment. Um, so this is just a, um, a look from April of last year, April of this year. Uh, we've done almost 5,000 uh, code cases in that year span. Um, we had uh, almost uh, a little more than 3,000 were actually complied with, which is great. I'm sorry, more than 3,500 were complied with. Uh, the department receives on average 78 phone calls a day over its two main lines. And that doesn't include the uh, inspectors, uh, um, actual personal cell phones, which they give out to, to pretty much everyone they meet. So uh, we receive a multitude of phone calls a day. We um, average about uh, 200 web complaints a month. And uh, we had over 2,000 snipe signs collected. Uh, we had 14 mosquito violations. That number is actually growing because it's summertime, but this was taken back in April. So um, the code compliance department is a very active department, working very hard for the city. Some of our performance measurements, um, we talked about major site plans already. Uh, we've added some new performance measurements that we thought were important to sort of give a complete picture to the entire department, not just planning. So those include the number of building permits that are reviewed within the time frame, um, the number of emails replied to, because we have a multitude of email sites, which include uh, not just web planning, web building, and web code. Um, and we're also including the number of code cases which reach voluntary compliance, which is really the number that we're looking for. It's the, it's the amount of code cases that are complied prior to going to magistrate. That's the 
the, the real number that should be looked at, and we're really pushing for 75%. We feel that that is a, a reachable goal for us. Uh, some additional performance measures um, are the number of permits. You know, we are in, of course, an economic boom, so our permits keep rising, which is great. Uh, we estimate to receive more than 8,000 permits this year for building. Um, our certificates of use have remained fairly steady around 500 a year. And our, of course, our courtesy notices and our violations, um, they continue to increase. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are doing anything wrong. It just means that you know, we're doing our job in a more efficient manner. So let's talk about some major goals for our department for next year. Uh, to continue the comprehensive code review. So the uh, city, uh, again, I'm sorry, the staff last year did nine code reviews uh, to brought forward to you. It'll be 10. Uh, we're looking to also bring another 10 to you uh, next year to continue our comprehensive code um, overhaul. Um, we are continuing to develop um, the central core, which, doesn't inclu which includes Pioneer Grove, as well as Dixie Highway in the, in the surrounding areas. Um, the uh, Complete Streets Master Plan, Implementation Plan, so uh, as most of you are aware of Hillsborough Boulevard improvements, uh, the improvements that have happened along Ocean Drive, those are parts of the first phase of those plans. We're looking to move beyond that and create some additional projects. And we are in the process, we were actually started the process of the rezoning of all the county zoning districts into uh, city zoning. <coughs> Um, for the upcoming year, what the uh, Planning Development Services uh, Department is looking forward to do is a Dixie Highway walking audit, which is an opportunity for local residents, business owners, uh, any really anyone, to walk with engineers from Broward County and get input into where they feel sidewalks, uh, ADA, bus stops, any other types of improvements need to be made. We're hoping to do that this fall. Uh, of course, the phase two for the infrastructure plan, which will help us with the, um, the actual implementation of the project, the Complete Streets Master Plan. We have a lot of upcoming site plans that uh, most of you are probably familiar with. These are ones that haven't necessarily been submitted yet, which is the Pinnell Marina, Sandpiper Point, um, R&DC, and List Industries expansions, and some upcoming major land use uh, plan amendments as well. So for building and code compliance, some of the um, updates that are happening for this year, uh, we have the upcoming town hall meet and greet, which is uh, in this building on uh, Saturday, June 30th, for anyone who would like to attend. Uh, we have, and that was, I'm sorry, that was as Vice Mayor Battle's suggestion. Uh, and similarly, as Commissioner Parnes has suggested, we have an upcoming building contractor training meeting we'd like to hold this fall. Um, we have a new software we'd like to introduce for permit tracking and improvements to the customer service areas to building and code compliance that will be made with the changes to City Hall. And upcoming development per review, uh, Crystal Lake is just around the corner. That's over 400 individual permits we'll be looking at, including the uh, other site plans we see. So we actually are seeing, looking for a fairly large increase in permitting for this next year. Uh, let's talk numbers. Uh, so for the most part, our numbers are consistent. Uh, we do have a, a small rise in planning due to personnel. Um, the rise in building uh, goes to additional scanning, uh, need to scan uh, documents. And then the, the rise in code compliance comes to um, additional requests for nuisance abatement. Overall, we're at a 6% increase for the three departments. And uh, future considerations for the department. Um, so additional uh, funding for the Pioneer Grove, Dixie Highway infrastructure, and marketing. Uh, as you know, Chris mentioned, you know, marketing is a very important aspect for these projects, and it's important that we get the word out and advertise as much as we can about the ability for development here in the city of Deerfield Beach. Um, we are looking to add to the code compliance department. Uh, we do not have an administrative assistant, so as I mentioned, you know, the almost 80 phone calls we receive a day, um, you know, we don't actually have anyone who can, who can pick up that phone. Most of our inspectors are out in the field throughout the day. Uh, also, the additional new code compliance inspectors, uh, possibility of having a transportation planner with all the transportation improvements that we're making throughout the year. E-plan review uh, is something that the city is, I think, should be very interested in, which essentially is electronic uh, permitting, the ability, for a developer or a homeowner 
to electronically submit plans instead of um, having to print the plans and submit the plans. It allows for a faster review, it allows for more accurate review, and that is something that I think would uh, greatly benefit this city. It's the future for permitting. A lot of other cities have gone towards this, and I think we should as well. Um, the city is actively working on code for historic preservation uh, and uh, changes to certificate of use, county zoning, as we recently discussed, and the storage of outdoor materials um, for uh, heavy construction uh, and industrial uses. So just as a wrap up, you know, what, this, what the department is focused on is, um, you know, the vision for Dixie Highway, a Pioneer Grove, and of course the redevelopment of the city and the redevelopment of the Central Floor. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Commissioner? I have one. Commissioner Parnas? Yes, I, I had a mechanical inspector in my home today inspecting air conditioning. I think it would be wise and make it easier for the public as well as the inspectors if they wore some type of identification badge so that people aren't afraid to open the door. Guy knocks on my door. I, I knew he was coming, but not everybody calls to what time is he coming or what. And I was able to open the door without a problem, but. I'm thinking of a great many seniors that we have. Right. Spectre comes and knocks on the door. At least he should have some sort of ID. He should have a, a badge. A badge. Should he provide a badge? He should be providing you a badge. Yeah, okay. and it should be worn when they go knocking on the door to inspect. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Powell, uh, the walking tour, uh, and, and, and I heard you say it was going to be in on, uh, was it Dixie or Post Yeah, on Dixie. Okay. Can we really get some press about that? To we get are. People we will. Um, we're actually looking to uh, set a date sometime in the fall. Okay. Um, obviously not in the hottest part of the year. We don't want to do it. We want to right. do it when it's a little cooler out. Um, and uh, we're working right now with the county on the best of um, opportune times. And, and they actually have budgetary dollars to advertise. Oh, so, um, yes, yeah, so the, the county is... Um, be doing that for us which is great sounds good next thing the historic preservation you have a copy of their ordinance they're uh, seeking comment they're redoing their yes yeah, we are an active commenter to the county um, yeah. so one of our planners Mary, Mary Ellen Scott actually has a, uh, a background in historic preservation mm -hmm. and she has been our liaison to the county she's been one of the um, really one of the active members of the board, uh, of the organization, she's not part of the board, she's you know, part of the comment. Um, and we're working on uh, trying to uh, essentially be on our own. Uh, the, the county is essentially giving us two choices. You can follow the county and the county guidelines, or you can have your own. And we would like to have our own. So okay. that's what we're working for. Sounds good. And I had a question to come from uh, a, a citizen who wanted to know are we going to have a sign uh, which says historic district or something like that? So when you have a historic designation, you are able to get a sign from the state. So we work on a historic designation. I mean, we're working on one right now for Brent Hiller versus Milton Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. um, and so any other areas that we would uh, deem to be historic and, and would preserve as such would be worthy of a sign. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Drosky. Can we go back to the numbers slide, please? Code compliance. Does, does the number include? We, we just added an officer for the illegal. That is not in our budget. Sorry, that's in the budget for um, sustainable management. Sustainable management. So we we didn't actually lose or gain an officer, but we. Uh, we donated one of our own and brought on a new one. That's what we did. So we brought it, we gave them someone who knows the city already and, and knows what they're doing. So they wouldn't have to start off fresh. So what was the, the increase, uh, the 5% increase? Right, for nuisance abatement. Um, nuisance abatement is, is a myriad of things, uh, unkept lawns, uh, dirty pools, uh, boarding up structures, unsafe properties, unsafe trees, uh, cars and vehicles need to be towed. So it's just a myriad of things. 
So that's like a, a labor or a, a materials is that, cost that we're talking about? Yeah, essentially what, what happens in nuisance abatement is, is uh, it gives us the opportunity to immediately correct a violation that can't be corrected by the homeowner or, or the property owner. Um, and then what we do is essentially we, uh, through the lien process, you know, those, those dollars go back in, in from the property owner. And how so, much do we recoup? Do you have those, those numbers? I don't have the numbers with me right now. Um, about a third. And the other two thirds just sits on the, on the tax roll? They get, it depends on the lien process. Depends on, on which, which properties do come into compliance and then do abate their liens. The 12% for planning services, what was that increase again? So essentially most of it is for personnel, the about $200,000 increase, about $146,000 comes from personnel services. Um, the remaining $54,000 is uh, some increases in software, office equipment, and, and personnel training. So back, back to personnel, um, is that new personnel <coughs> or merit existing, or existing right. personnel? Exactly. Existing personnel. We're not thinking anyone new this year. So there's no net. It's a net zero for your department for employees. As far as the operating, yes, yes, we we haven't uh, necessarily increased that portion of our budget. Was there? As far as operating, you, you caveated. I guess your your statement is there an increase somewhere else or? Um, well, there are reductions in some places and increases in others. Uh, we did reductions to our contractual services. Um, we made reductions into um, some of our uh, other things we were allowed to, some of our marketing efforts. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, our increases were based on just uh, department needs um, that, you know, uh, since I said, like I said, our software and office equipment that we need to have for this year. I mean, this isn't really for you, it's for the, I guess the managers, you know, going forward, instead of us grilling the department heads on what the increases and decreases are, if they can have that part of their presentation, that may, that may help us to consolidate our, our, our questioning. No problem. That's all. Uh, Mr. Power, looking at your goals from last year, I know, and we, one of the big ones was obviously the comprehensive code review, and, and we, that was a lofty goal to try to do in one year. We knew that probably was going to happen, and I noticed you put to continue to, to strive for that goal, which I know you have been. So that makes sense to me. Obviously, we completed the Pioneer uh, Grove land use plan and zoning amendment, so we were able to do that. But I noticed that uh, DRC process, the streamlined submittal review times. Yeah, that's what's going to be coming to you in September. Okay, but that is completed at this point. It just needs to go through commission approval. Essentially. Essentially. We're there. Okay. What about, and I noticed this was in your goals, it wasn't mentioned whether it was accomplished, and it's not in the current goals for this upcoming year, which is the RSO medical office zoning district near yes. the hospital. Okay, so thank you. So actually, it is listed as what is the county zoning. Um, what staff determined and with, with legal guidance is that we really can't create an overlay district on county zoning. Uh, that would not be possible. So the concept of doing an overlay district, as we originally intended, isn't feasible. What we need to do is rezone these properties of a county zoning district into a city zoning district. And what we would like to do, instead of actually doing an overlay, is just rezone the properties that immediately surround the hospital into a comparable zoning district that would complement the hospital. And that's probably what we're doing with the county zoning. So, this, I mean, that to me is not that's not you failing to be able to accomplish that goal. It's a matter of realizing that that goal is not something that could be accomplished in the way we were approaching it. And we just need to change that up. So that's what you had presented as your new goals? Yes, the county okay. yes. Hey, looking for some so clarification. To, um, no, I, I, I have it right here, so I see what you're talking about. Just love it. Um, It's, a lot, it's, it's your number four on your list. It's the rezone all county zone parcels. That's, the city that's zone. what that means. Okay, a little clarity on that would have helped us. So that's, no, but uh, I understand it's, it's relatively easy to follow. How much of the 12% for planning services is going towards uh, personnel? How much is it towards uh, other items? Uh, the net is about 146,000. How personnel. much of the 12% goes towards, you've got an increase, so how much is it going towards personnel? Uh, 
Sounds like about 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 65 percent. About 146,000 of the all of it. Then, so the entire increase goes strictly to personnel. No, we so. didn't really increase our operating budget this year. I mean, yeah. to the minimal amount. So, yeah. we're, we weren't really proposing that this year. Yeah, let me help you help um, with that, please. Can you go Sorry. back to that screen? There, yes. Can I answer sure. your question on that? So, one of the things that we started doing about was it two fiscal years ago, Hugh? Roughly. Yeah. What we do is never before in operating departments did we include health insurance. So what happens is now what you're seeing is the COLA, the um, uh, merit, and health insurance. So that's also included. It's just not the 2% um, merit average and the two and a half percent cola it's also health insurance if you guys want it broken down like that we'll be more than happy to try to include that and i doubt that we can get them for tonight's uh presentations that quickly but we'll work on that for tomorrow night's presentations but that's where part of it is the other part of his increase for planning um, and development services also deals with purchasing some more licensing rights to do um Esri, which, it, which uh, Mr. McKenzie spoke about last night, which is for GIS because planning and development services uses GIS to share information, to build the layers and the maps, things of that nature. And do you want to take it from yeah, there? Yeah, that's exactly Eric? right. The software increases and the and minor equipment increases essentially result to these, these technology changes. Our computers require you know, upgrades in order to be able to use the software that we have uh, for, for GIS. Um, which our department uh, utilizes GIS. Every every person in our department uses utilizes GIS, not just for building, and creating maps, but for you know cataloging and, and um, uh, using data. Uh, that also includes things like you know the software programs to the end of SketchUp, Adobe Photoshop, and Suite that we're using now to help do our own marketing and promotion. Okay, so I, and I guess that's kind of what my question was partially about, I probably worded it improperly, so my apologies. How much of the increase that we see here is software minor equipment changes? Sure. So um, essentially for our software increases, it's, it's about uh, $2,000 more than we, we've asked for in the past. Um, our minor equipment has gone up a little more than 5,000, uh, and our, our training has gone up a little more than 5,000 uh, as well. Okay, so, but you're asking for an increase in that department of about $200,000. So 100, about 146000 of that is, as, as, as Burgess was just stating, related to the personnel services, about 54000 is a So that's where, cost they, that's where the health insurance and, and all that right. wasn't included in the past is in, right. is in here now. Yeah. We decided to do this this way now. Okay. So it's a little difficult when you look at it because it, it's hard to do apples. Yeah, I've got the apples. Apples. Sorry. <laughs> so that, that is a curve that I think probably should have been explained earlier. Um, but, but we're also estimating for things to go down. I mean, how come we're looking at uh, building permits to go down? How come we're looking at landscape permits to go down? And, and um, we're also looking at our courtesy notices to go down. I think that we've sort of peaked in a couple of those factors and we're going to steady out. That's what we kind of feel is the case. Um, as far as some of the permitting issues, um, the city used to have Lighthouse Point piggyback off of us uh, for contractual services. We've since ended that contract. Okay. Um, that kind of solved a little bit of that. Um, but for some of the other reasons, like we looked at, you know, development changes on an annual basis for what will probably come before the planning department, and then there's a bit of a lag between the planning, you know, the building department. For example, I mean, uh, the Crystal Lake uh, golf course redevelopment change occurred back in October of last year, uh, and we don't really expect permitting to happen until probably early of winter of next year, you know, and that, that's going to be a three-year plan, plan. So we kind of look at this as a as it goes out, okay. um, and we try to determine how many permits we're going to be seeing. Okay. Um, the other question is, we have the abandoned property ordinance, and, and I think it's a great service to, to piggyback on what Commissioner Drosky was talking about with our nuisance abatement. That's so the residents don't suffer. Our, our code compliant, our, our code policy 
it take it's it's a it's not a fast turnaround on that, and it's not because they're not doing a good job. It's because that's just the nature of the beast. You have to give warnings. You have to give them the opportunity to come into compliance. You have to go through a special magistrate. It takes time. But in that meantime, while they're not doing anything or things aren't moving, people are suffering because you've got two foot grass, uh, all these issues. So we go on the property and we actually take care of that. Uh, exactly right. The abandoned property ordinance that we have in place, which allows us to go ahead and do nuisance abatement and come in and do that, allows us to recoup that money, but that's only for an abandoned, something that qualifies under the abandoned property. You might have people living in these homes that simply are not bringing them up the code, and we're trying to get them at least so they're not mm -hmm. a, a complete anchor around the neck of the neighborhood. That's right? true. So that's why we're only recouping a small portion of that. It is. It takes time. I mean, the reality sure. is we're spending a dollar immediately because there's some type of emergency, whereas some of these cases can linger for a couple of years. And so it, it does. It takes time. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Yes. I have another yes. question. Um, uh, uh, Vice, Vice Mayor and then Commissioner Parnas. Thank um, you. Mr. Powell, and, and, and I guess, and I don't want to belabor this issue, but I heard the mayor talk about abandoned property and my uh, colleague talked about something else. Unsafe structures, how are we planning to address that going forward? Right, thank you. The unsafe structures board will come back. We are, we are working towards that. Um, it is a, a laborious and long process um, to get underneath the, the county's uh, regulation. The first step was the standard housing code that you approved at the last commission right. meeting. And by moving that forward, and actually with the increase in the abatement process, the actual dollar increases that we're requesting this year is really for that purpose. Okay. Um, so it is something that we're working towards. Um, I did not consider it to be a goal for next year because frankly I don't know if it's going to happen by the end of next year. But it is something we are working towards. Thank you. Perfect. Commissioner Parnas? Yes. Is it my understanding we're trying to get away from the magistrate system? Not necessarily. What we're trying to do is create a process in which if the magistrate's responsibility to, um, to, to the, the property owner is to determine if, if um, more time is needed and, if it's in, and whether or not a, a fine needs to be levied. And that really is when the, the issue can be resolved. There are many times where an issue cannot be resolved. Illegal dumping is a great example. You know, you've done it, it's over. You can't fix it. You know, so we are, we've created this new civil citation process, which allows us to immediately find the, the, the violator. They don't necessarily have to go in front of the magistrate now because they've been fined. They have to pay their fine. And if they don't do those things, then their action now belongs in circuit court. So it, it's, a, it's a separate process that gives us a, really an additional tool, um, but it's not intended to necessarily curb the amount of violations that we do. It's really an additional tool for code compliance to stop these offenders who have done something that really isn't correctable. So we will have the magistrate and we will have another system? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Vicki Plastic Picard. I'm the Community Development Director. And to my left is Alexa Ogbon, the city's grant writer. This evening, I'm going to present to you um, community development. Our areas of responsibility includes planning, administration, implementation, and management of the federal and state entitlement grants. That's something we've been known for um, over the last few years. In addition to that, we've been um, working aggressively with all our departments on grant writing and grant management. And I'll show you some numbers later on in my presentation. We're also the city's liaison to state, federal, and local agencies, including Broward County Public Schools. Over the last year, we've really ramped up our um, communication with them. Also, the city liaison with the Deerfield Beach Housing Authority. Last year, actually this year, we started our education initiative. I'll go into more details on that. And then working with planning and economic development on our affordable housing and workforce development. Our achievements for 2018. Um, as you know, we received 400,000 from the state legislature for the development of the Brand Hilda Knowles Memorial Park. So far, we've received 2.6 million in grant funds. 
We've completed 23 rehab projects. That's an increase in our goal. Our goal was 20 and we completed 23. We provided five households with purchase assistance and um, we're anticipating actually having three closings this week, so that's actually gonna be eight. One of the things we um, recently completed is the translation of our home repair application and our purchase assistance application into three languages, Spanish, Creole, and Portuguese. Our additional achievements, um, we reestablished the Education Advisory Board. They had their first meeting in February, and we've met every month since then and will continue to meet. We facilitate we, um, we are facilitating the quarterly meetings with the local school principals, building our, continue to, continuing to build our relationships with the schools. We completed the first year of our mentoring programs where a city staff actually goes into two of our schools, Park Ridge Elementary and Deerfield Beach Elementary um, for the Reading Pilots program and also to the meet. As you know, grade level, third grade level reading is a goal of Broward County. Broward County right now is at 57% of our students, of our third grade students read at third grade level. And most of our elementary schools in um, Deerfield were either at the average or below the average. So that's one of the areas when we meet with the school principals is focusing on um, grade level reading. We also coordinated the first welcome, um, the first day of school. We had a welcome back um, to school event for all our elementary schools. I know many of you participated at that with that, and the principals felt like felt that it was a great way to start the school, and they're hoping that we'll be able to do that again this year um, for them. We also, as a part of our community outreach, we've partnered with the Center for Active Aging. Um, in February, we did we love. DFB Seniors events, we did an event at um, Praxis and also um, at the Center for Active Aging for our seniors. We don't want to leave our seniors out. So our performance measurements. Um, as you can see, we do have new performance measurements. Um, the number of rehabs I mentioned, we had, we had completed 23, our goal was 20, so we've exceeded our goal for that. Um, we list our CDBG funding received. Um, we don't have control over that, but it's good to see what the numbers are. As you can see, they've increased slightly um, over the few years. Um, the number of programs that we administer, we administered four, we are administering four programs. We increased um, our goal of purchase assistance was five, and we anticipate um, being eight because there are closings happening. Um, total of grant applications. Um, this year we've done 15. Alexa came on board July 1st, and we've been meeting with all our departments and aggressively applying for more um, grants that we've ever had in the past. So we've done 15. I think last week she submitted five. <laughs> I was supposed to that. Um, and then number of awards. Because we recently submitted them, so far we have three awards. Um, we don't know if we're going to receive it, so we didn't want to put a number. We do anticipate us getting as much as we can, but um, I didn't want to give you a number. We, we don't know if we're going to get them. They're all competitive grants, so we don't know if we're going to get the fund in there. And that's the dollar amount we've received so far. Something we started um, to track is the number of appropriations requests. This the year we submitted four appropriations requests. We did receive one, which was the Brand Hilden Knowles project. Um, due to um, the events that happened this year, a lot of funding was um, geared elsewhere, but we do hope to continue our efforts in um, seeking funding <coughs> from the state on an annual basis um, for some of our smaller projects. <coughs> We've also been, work been working with our lobbyists on any issues that come up to make sure that the um, city of Deerfield Beach is um, seen and that anything that can impact us positively, um, we do reach out to them on infrastructure issues or different issues that are out there. Um, I mentioned the, part, the mentoring program, um, our partnership with the schools, and the outreach that we're doing in the community. Our budget. So currently our budget shows um, is a uh, 48.5% increase. Um, that includes the salary. One of the things we added last year's budget was a community development supervisor. This is offset by our CDBG funds, community development block grant. 
in the past, um, Deerfield Beach Housing Authority was our administrator for the program. Um, however, we've changed our contract, so they focus primarily on the project base. As you can see, our numbers have increased in terms of the projects that we can complete, and the city will do the administration. Um, there are plans that we have to submit to our funding agencies, reporting on a quarterly and monthly basis, um, attending the meeting, so we're taking on that responsibility where and Deerfield Beach Housing Authority can focus on the program component of it. So that's why there's an increase there, as well as um, there's plan and design for improvements along Dixie Highway, that's a project we're gonna do next year. Um, Try and Give Back is also a project we're gonna do, um, which has the increase in the funding. And also, um, with Alexa on board, a grant management system. Um, the grant management system was very decentralized. We did not know all of the funding that the city, there was not one location where we can pinpoint all our grant funds that we have to make sure that we're in compliance. We're submitting reporting. We are um, doing closeout reports and knowing who that contact person is. So we're proposing to have a grant management system on board that not only we can do that, but one of, also we can get output notice on when grant funding is available. A lot of times when we get the notice, it's a week or two and sometimes we have to come to the commission where this funding, it actually, this, this program actually will um, filter all grants that are available and we'll have notice versus having to search for the grants. It provides, um, we tell what our needs are and we'll, we'll provide a list of various grants that are out there. And this is some of the things I mentioned previously, but um, we want to, for our future consideration and goals, implement a high school internship program. We established a teen youth council. I mentioned the grant management system. DFB Tribe Gives Back. I spoke about the plan and design for improvements along Dixie Highway. Identify city-owned residential vacant lots to partner with DBHA to develop the lots. Also work with organizations, community organizations, to promote various programs and resources available. Um, we'll continue to translate additional documents in multiple languages, and also um, an, a government academy. <coughs> One of the things we need to look at is the threat of reduction of or elimination of CDBG home and ship. These are all entitlement um, grant funds that we receive for our home repair and purchase assistance program, as well as projects we do in the community um, in the low and moderate income areas. Increase the city's visibility with the state and federal agencies and delegates. We've been working with planning, um, planning development services, economic development, and our environmental services regarding funding that will be needed for various infrastructure projects, 10th Street, um, and we've really increased our, to increase our visibility as the city. Um, monitor legislative items at both the federal and the state level, and we've increased that as well, and work with government relations consultants to influence and make a positive impact on the city. So that's some of these areas. Um, we've started to do that this year, and we'll continue um, next year to make sure that we're at the table um, when there are discussions and the funding's available that we can utilize those funds. And then this is just some of the programs that we completed, this project we completed this year. Do you have any questions? Commission? Yeah, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, each year we fund uh, a, a number of nonprofits. Uh, we're going to be getting, or if we approve this budget, we're going to be getting the grants, uh, what you call the management system. I would like to see us put into play uh, a program, not really a program, but when you are noticed or you find grants that will apply to nonprofits, that you actually send them notice with a copy of that, uh, you know, the requirements. And maybe that could help us uh, um, as a city manager in terms of, uh, and, and you would come back and if they get those grant funds, of course we're going to say, hey, you know, we did this and this, whatever. Um, but I would like to see that happen because we have a void there in terms of working with our nonprofits. 
And I believe that's one of the reasons why they all come to us for funding, because they're hurting for funds just like we are. But if we know of applications uh, we're in uh, grant, grant requirements or whatever that they can apply for funds, it would help a great deal. I am not so sure that we are doing all that we can do to um, help, and, and, and it's all dictated because uh, by what we put in our plan. I know that much, one way or the other. I've had a, a, a flurry of, of, of requests in the, latter, in the last month, basically. It's the beginning of hurricane season. Where can I get money to assist me with putting up hurricane shelters? I mean shutters, okay? So, and, and we don't really do that, uh, but if, there, if we could gather that type of information and you can have it available uh, for citizens when they call, that would help uh, those citizens a great deal. We're talking about community development then and how we develop those communities that are just you know, marginal communities or whatever. There is a need for hurricane shutters uh, in certain parts of this city, basically. And, 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 and I would say all over the city, one way or the other. And people need to understand uh, where they can go get help in terms of get, uh, getting hurricane shutters, one way or the other. I am not so sure that we do the best job in terms of advertising when we, t when we are taking comments, one way or the other. Uh, and I'm putting me on the line uh, until I'm reelected here. Me on the line, I've asked with PIO, we're going to be sitting together so that we can come up uh, uh, with a strategy, uh, Mr. City Manager, so that, and it might cost a little bit more money in the PIO budget. But uh, I'd like to see us do a better job of having, uh, I mean, this is appalling. How many people do we have? These are major budget hearings, and how many people do we have here? Even if we have to get a bus and send them out to Century Village to pick us up some people, we need to have input from those people uh, or from the citizenry on everything that we do, basically. So if we could look into um, doing that, and of course, uh, Rebecca will be working together uh, to uh, get some, extract some money from the city manager. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Drosky. This includes the, the nonprofits. <coughs> Pardon me, the money the city gives? No. No? No. Mm -hmm. It's in the nonprofits are in a non departmental account. It's not under the community development. Where what, where does that fall, Mr. Manager? The nonprofits <coughs> such as the junior achievement organization and gateway uh, out or what community right. outreach right. they fall under the uh, general fund community participation uh, budget or line item department it's technically not a department but it's set up as such so that's where those monies are okay. um, maybe we can reserve With, some time tomorrow yeah. to briefly discuss that um, some of those uh, uh, such as uh, what's the one family central and a couple yeah. of the others actually have been moved to the active aging department just to make it because that's where they directly go anyway um, but some of these others we were going to place them under uh, uh, community development but we decided that uh, this year, this upcoming fiscal year would not be the year to do it. We'd rather wait, um, but we can certainly talk about about those. Um, right now, we've held the line, so whatever they're getting this current fiscal year, that's all we've put in, whether the, with the exception of the area agency on aging and a couple of the other ones where we know we get $3 back for every dollar we give, and there's a formula that they request. Otherwise, we've held the line, and if you want to eliminate those, those are certainly something that we can discuss. If that's policy direction from the commission. It makes no difference to us. Okay. I don't want to mix apples and oranges, but yeah. I'll bring it up later. Yeah. <coughs> Is that it? 
Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, just real quick, the, the total you have for your uh, performance measurements, the total number of purchase assistants, <coughs> is that the first time home buyer program? Yes. So um, we did a lot less than what we were, were, were shooting for. What happened with that? Do we know? So it's based on the funding that we that we received. Um, as you know, even though for the CDBG funding slightly went up, for SHIP each year we've received a reduction. Um, in 2017, we received 400,000. Last year, um, the current year, we're at 300,000, and it's projected July 1st that we're gonna get 100,000. So wow. those affect our numbers. Excellent, okay, thank you. Um, it looks like all your major goals that you set out to do from last year's budget, you touched on them and, and, and achieved them for the most part. Um, you might want to, we might want to get a little more specific on some of those because they're a little broad. So, so you, but I think you, your metrics that you have uh, seem to work out pretty well. The how many personnel do you have? Are you expecting to have for this upcoming budget? Four. Four. So it's the same. So I'm trying to understand again the, the increase that we're looking at here. Can you explain that to me one more time? Sure. Um, for the current budget year, um, the community development supervisor was not fully funded in this um, budget year, whereas it will be moving for um, in 2019. Okay. You want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just quickly. So we only funded it for 50 percent because. We wanted to work with Dr. Jarman, who oversees Deerfield Beach Housing Authority and also the family empowerment that actually uh, runs the CDBG, make sure everything was okay. So we only funded it at 50% for this current fiscal year 18. Next year it's fully funded. And these again include insurance, COLA, merit, things of that okay. nature for personal services. And you wanna talk a little bit about the increases um, with the uh, DBR and things of that okay. yes. growth. Um, we, d we do have funded set aside um, 20000 for the design and plan and design for improvements along Dixie. Also for the Deerfield Beach Tribe Give Back, um, the management system that I mentioned. So the total increase is 169000 of that, 115 is in um, salaries and also with the insurance. So the balance from that is the operating component, which is about 50,000 of that is the project base, which I mentioned um, the implementation of the grant management system, the tribe gives back planning and design um, for improvements along Dixie, and then also our translation um, translate in our documents, it, it does cost quite a bit. So the 50, about 50,000 is with the operating for the projects. Okay, uh, in the administering, administering of the grant programs, the, the numbers that you gave to us and the total of grants that were uh, awarded, is that all across the city for every department, everything? And these are for only new grants that we received. Okay. Uh, just new grants. We, we have existing grants that um, are over a time period um, that have not been fully expended, but these are just new grants that we, we've been awarded in 2018. Um, we're still waiting for additional because um, a lot of the grants you have to wait six to nine months to, to hear a response, but these are just for the few that we've received thus far. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Mr. <clears throat> yeah, I, there's something uh, the manager said that I don't quite comprehend. When we said in 2018 we only funded about 50 percent, and now 19 we're gonna they're gonna f be funded 100 percent. So where did the other portion of their money come from? If it yeah. Well, basically what happens is for the uh, first six months of the fiscal year we don't hire that person we don't fill that position so it's for the lap or the second half of the fiscal year that we fund that position advertise and fill it and then once they're they're uh, hired the candidate is selected and we hire them then um, they're in and then they're at a hundred percent for the following fiscal year okay then then there was something else and Alexis, I, I think you're doing great as getting us more grants, but I, 
I don't know if I understand. If we are awarded a grant, does that help reduce our budget, or does that just go on a, a new project or something? How does that work when we get money from the state or something? It all depends on the grant. I'm sorry, I'm answering for no, Alexa, but, but yeah, I just how, trying to figure out. If yeah, so it all depends. In some cases, like for instance, if we receive the safer grant, which helps us with firefighters, or the cops grant, which helps us with deputies then usually you're adding to the budget, but but, but that's no covered by the grant. Federal government's covering it for uh, partially for like 75% the first year, and then it goes down until after year three. But a lot of these grants that they're going after are actually for um, uh, capital projects or just enhanced. If they get it, it goes designated to something that's yeah. not in right yeah. now. In, yeah, there are very few grants that actually pay for continuing operations. Okay, yeah. except the ones you described. Anything, Alexa? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Grosky. Just, just a quick follow-up question, then. So, of the 15 grant applications submitted, how many are still pending? Because that would make your three that are awarded seem deceptively low. If you have 12 that are pending and three were granted, then you're at 100%, so. Of that, um, 10 are, are pending. We received um, notice on about five, two we didn't receive. And so you're three, out of, you're three out of five? Yes. Great. Hope to continue. That puts it into more perspective, thank you. Anything else? Just said very quickly, um, you know, it's, what you all are doing, and, and, and I have to applaud my uh, city manager for uh, going up to Washington this year. If we don't keep those contacts, Mr. Mayor and Mr. City Manager, if we don't build up Deerfield Beach with our legislators and, and, and all of those other folks uh, that we have to come in, into contact with, we're doing Deerfield Beach a disservice. I, and, and you know, and I, and I know people out there are going to say, oh, why are they going to Washington, whatever. But there's a reason why you do these types of things. And in order for us to get out there, if we would not have even known about, uh, and unless it could attest to this, about the Opportunity Zone stuff, had we not gone to Washington on that trip one way or the other. So it is imperative, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we keep out there, and we, we're in the forefront meeting and greeting uh, the people. And, and I say that to say this Broward Days is coming up um, uh, as the city manager. And we need to have a presence. I cannot stress that enough, that we need to have a presence at the table so that we can know when the monies are out there and we can go after those dollars. Thank you. If, if yes. I could just quickly, yeah, I just want to make sure that um, everyone, including the public in particular, know that um, both Vicki and Alexa have done a great job because, yeah, it's important with the, the legislators, absolutely agree, because they really help push things through. But it's their relationship building that's happening with those uh, agency heads and, and the division chiefs, whether it's in Tallahassee or up in DC, um, that make a big difference. In fact, uh, Alexa, since I stole your answer earlier, why don't you just give a brief update on what's going on with the EDA grant? Because this could be a big deal um, for the city. It's something we definitely want to work toward. Thank you. Um, so in March, uh, we took a trip to DC and um, we met with several federal departments, one of them being economic development. Um, so the EDA, and out of that came a contact um, for the representative of Florida. His name's Greg Bidet. So we met with him and we did a site visit here and we've been meeting with him back and forth, going over several big infrastructure projects related to um, disaster recovery, resilience, and um, so far that's looking good. And that grant, it ranges, um, but it can be anywhere from one million to six million um, with infrastructure, street improvements, underground utilities. So it would definitely bolster our city. Um, 
So yeah, we're very excited about that. So I'm uh, 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 and one thing to point out, you go on trips like that, we, I attended a meeting in which you're competing for the same, you're essentially com trying to sell your city and why they should, we should get these representatives to advocate for us when they have other people to advocate for. And we walked into a meeting, our staff was in there, and we had another city who's vying for the same thing we were, and we thought they were on a tour guide. They, they had no idea that they actually were professionals that were there from as elected officials from a city and we had our staff there and, and the comparison between our presentation why they would book both of us at the same time i have no idea but um, the presentation done by our staff compared to just their presence um, and what they attempted to present uh, there was no comparison and, and that certainly bore uh, is going to bear some more fruit so thank you very much. You guys did an outstanding job. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners, Deerfield Beach Tribe, and our Deerfield Beach residents. My name is Donna Franza. I represent the Department of Active Aging, and it's my honor tonight to introduce you to Sherry Wilson, our Assistant Director of the Department of Active Aging, and one of our newest team members, Maria Carmen Ortez Figaro, who is our grants coordinator specifically for the Department of Active Aging. As you know, last year we embarked on a brand new name for our department to the Department of Active Aging, Real Life Happens. We've kind of used the LIFE acronym to show what we do at the Department of Active Aging, which is we have a multitude of learning opportunities for individuals. Our goal is to encourage individuals to remain independent and active for as long as possible as it relates to fall prevention and uh, health and wellness. In addition, we see day in, day out the number of friendships that are being developed at the Center for Active Aging with individuals of all ages. And you'll see a new energy due to the name change to the Center for Active Aging where we actually have seen a decline in the average number of our population. Typically for the Center of Active Aging, it's been about 78. We're seeing actually decline a little bit to 76. Still in our daycare programs, the average age is approximately 81. And we are continuously serving uh, about 75% of the population is over the age of 75. Some of the services and programs that we provide at the Center for Active Aging include information referral services, education and training services, health support, and wellness services, counseling services, recreation services, outreach, and transportation services. And I'll de describe those a little bit later. At the Center for Active Aging, we used to say we had benefits or values. We really have some different types of amenities uh, for individuals primarily over the age of 60. We have a concrete meal site where we serve between um, the seniors, the Alcindor's daycare, and the multicultural daycare, and the preschool. Um, nearly 20,000 meals a year. And for some of the seniors, that may be the only meal that they receive. It, meet, it meets a, a third of the recommended daily allowance. So we serve as a congregate meal site. We also have the Emergency Home Energy Assistance Program, which allows us to assist individuals who are 60 and over, income eligible, by paying for the electric bill twice a year during the heating season and the cooling season up to $600. In addition, we have a food pantry. We're very fortunate to have a multitude of community organizations that support us in our food pantry. Uh, we assisted 35 families this past year, and currently we're giving out food boxes that were donated by two local Girl Scout groups for hurricane preparedness for this year. We have about we had about 300 uh, food boxes there. Our medical loan closet, not very well known. We have canes, walkers, and uh, wheelchairs. This past year, we loaned out uh, just three from our medical loan closet. Do you have a small physical fitness exercise room, uh, which individuals enjoy each and every day? I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, health and wellness room, that's where we have most of our Center for Active Aging programming, which ranges from uh, yoga classes, whether it be on, on mats with stretching and flexibility, possibly is chief fitness programs, as well as um, enhanced fitness programs, which is an evidence-based program through Stanford University. Have a computer lab, which we have eight computers for individuals 
to uh, connect um, via wireless or uh, through the computers, or they also get training by uh, volunteers as well as students that we work with on their laptops, their iPhones, uh, their cameras, whatever they'd like to um, have at the computer lab. And we're embarking on a special partnership starting in July with the South Florida Asian Institute on a computer um, program with some assistance from the IT department along with the instructors that they'll provide for the seniors. We have a small library reading room, which we have large print uh, books, as well as a reading machine for people who are experiencing vision problems such as macular degeneration to read um, any type of publication they would like. In addition, we have a coffee shop and a small boutique, which helps to serve the needs of the seniors, particularly those that depend on our transportation, um, as well as the concrete mail site each and every day. They have accessibility to um, bagels, English muffins, as well as a small um, protein. We have a multitude of intergenerational activities. Of course, we're the only center in Broward County that has an on-site preschool, but we also work with local um, elementary schools as well as universities and colleges and um, the Health Occupation Students of America program at DFO Beach High School. And we have many volunteer opportunities, as I said, we couldn't open up our doors without volunteers. The next slide shows um, another component of our active aging, primarily adult daycare programs that are licensed through the Agency for Healthcare Administration, which we have our Alzheimer's Daycare Center, which is the uh, first dementia-specific daycare center in Brown County <coughs> to provide case management, screening, and assessment, caregiver training and support, and facility respite uh, for both the Alzheimer's Daycare participants, who can be any age that, that, is di that are diagnosed with any form of dementia, as well as memory loss, and then we have the Multicultural Daycare Center, which we serve individuals who speak uh, Creole, Spanish, as well as English. We do serve Portuguese. Right now, we currently do not have anybody that speaks Portuguese. In addition, we have our on-site preschool, as I mentioned before. We serve children two to five years old. We have the school readiness program, the voluntary pre-K for children that are four and five years old, as well as intergenerational programs. We worked with the Read to Me program with the United Way of Broward County and community development. Specifically, we had two uh, volunteers that worked with um, the voluntary pre-K program for, st uh, for students that were four years old going into uh, pre-kindergarten. And we also have a music together program and uh, one of our preschool teachers is certified in the Music Together program. We found both those program literacy as well as learning through mu music and fun to be very helpful. Uh, this particular area of our campus we are looking at as it relates to monitoring. We significantly have had uh, a low enrollment. We currently have uh, 15 children and we'll be looking and monitoring that on an ongoing basis. One of the newest areas that we de uh, developed this past year was the transportation. Sorry. Speak up? Okay, sure, I can speak up, sorry. Um, the transportation services um, division, we broke that away in a sense from the Center for Active Aging in which we're providing transportation uh, more so for all ages and we have worked closely with the Parks and Recreation Department on this endeavor. We have the agency coordination Paratransit services, which is a door-to-door -door service, uh, transportation service for individuals 60 years old and over, and that's in partnership with Broward County through the TROPS program. We also have the local service program, which is a state-funded program, and that, again, is door-to-door uh, -door service, and that program uh, funds not only transportation, but also a multicultural daycare center. The DFO Beach Express 1 and 2, those are community bus shuttles. That's for all ages and we go to primarily low-income government housing facilities within Broward County, and individuals allow accessibility to the grocery store, to medical appointments, uh, field trips, as well as um, a set route. Some individuals even get to work, as well as to get to the beach with the uh, <coughs> Express 1 and 2. The college tours is something that we, um, in partnership with Parks and Rec, that is sponsored through the uh, Urban League, and we provide transportation throughout the year, the school year that is, for approximately 50 children throughout Broward County to DFO Beach High School so they can get involved with the educational um, opportunities related to being co college bound and uh, learning as well as visiting some of the local universities and colleges within, within our community. 
We also have funding through the Community Development Block Grant that is for individuals 62 and over who live in DFL Beach. And that again is a fixed route or a set route in which we provide transportation uh, for low income government housing facilities to such locations as um, the beach on Fridays, uh, Freshville Flea Market, Aldi's, Walmart, and several other locations that really the community has told us that's where they would like to go to that do not have transportation um, accessibility. In addition, we have um, the after school program. We pick up children approximately um, three local schools and we bring them to the community centers here in DFL Beach after school so that they can participate in um, homework assistance as well as educational opportunities. We also have, uh, right now, we're providing summer camp field trips through our transportation department for all the parks and recs, um, excellent programs that they have developed and they've expanded this year in order to um, have a more fulfilling experience during the summer months for summer camps. We also provide transportation uh, approximately four to five times a year for the bison football as well as the cheerleaders for all of the away games here in Broward County. And then we participate in various different, uh, we participate as it relates to transportation, excuse me, for the different numerous wonderful special events that are coordinated by Parks and Rec in the city of Deerfield Beach, <coughs> such as the Arts Festival, the Sip and Stroll, the Fourth of July holiday, uh, Boots and Bourbon, uh, Ocean Rouge and Blues, and there's so many special events that the city's involved in, and our transportation team does an excellent job in providing transportation. This is uh, one of our buses. This is an older bus, but you'll see we just recently changed the name on the, on the bus to the Center for Active Aging, where life happens. Uh, we currently have 20 vehicles, 16 buses that are wheelchair accessible. Actually, 14 of them are wheelchair accessible. Two are 25 passenger buses. We also have one station wagon um, and two Broward County community buses that provide the DFL Beach Express 1 and 2 community bus services. We're anticipating receiving three new buses. Um, one is a 16 passenger bus with two uh, wheelchair tie downs, as well as a 12 passenger bus with two wheelchair tie downs. And we just ordered a Toyota Corolla, which we'll be using um, to complement the station wagon specifically for people who do not want to get in a bus and that need to get to either dialysis or chemotherapy or radiation type treatments um, and have a challenge in getting into a vehicle and do not want to be in a wheelchair. Interesting enough just to know we were supposed to get a Ford Fusion, but that was being built in Mexico, so we had to go for a Toyota Corolla because it was by USA here in um, America, which I thought that was kind of comical, but we're very fortunate uh, to receive funding through Florida Department of Transportation for, for those buses. Some agreements and, and contracts that we currently have um, with the the um, Department of Activation, we have the Older Americans Act of 1965, which is the Title III funding specifically for supportive services for individuals over the age of 60, which I'll elaborate um, shortly as it relates to counseling services, recreation services, and health support services. We do not anticipate any uh, changes in the future, and um, it's a little over $187,000. Title III-B under the Older Americans Act of 1965 is also federal money, and that covers our caregiver training and support. There's no changes, and that's a little over $5,000. The Alzheimer's Disease Initiative uh, funding is state funding, and that was um, funding that, that covers our case management in facility respite so that we can keep individuals at home in the communities with supportive services, as well as um, caregiver training and support. That we received a little, we we're going to receive $438,000. We got about a $6,000 increase. That was where we got the cut from the state of $195,150. That is non reoccurring money. Uh, Edith Letterberg from the Aging and Disability Resource Center uh, was able to find some money to continue to fund us as of July 1st and gave us $6,000. But we will continue to uh, work with our local legislators. Um, as well as state legislators so that that money will be restored for this upcoming year. Uh, local service project uh, funding, as mentioned before, is for our adult daycare center, particularly our multicultural adult daycare center, door-to-door uh, -door transportation service 
There's no changes there, a little over $132,000. And then our Emergency Home Energy Assistance Program is a federal money where we uh, assist individuals that are in danger of having the electricity turned off that are over 60, that are income eligible, and that's about $50,000. They will be changing um, that particular grant. The only change will start at, as of October 1 to September 30th, and it was running from uh, April 1st to March 31st. Some other grants that we've received, I mentioned before, the two new buses and one uh, sedan that we'll be ordering, that's through a Florida Department of Transportation grant, that is a federal grant of 80%, 10% uh, from the state. The other 10% is covered by the North, uh, Northeast Focal Point CASA, a nonprofit board of directors. Um, and that's a little bit over $208,000. We received through the Elder Services Resource Network, which is a private nonprofit grant, uh, $750 for our protocultural therapy um, program, which is um, our garden club, as well as the children's intergenerational program. The Broward Alzheimer's Coordinating Council, we received a uh, little over 1400 for our music therapy program. As I mentioned before, we've seen that music therapy um, and literacy, of course, very important for the children, but it's quite um, amazing to see with the Alzheimer's and individuals that have memory loss, the impact of a positive music therapy program. And that's an adult daycare center program. Our community development block grant, I mentioned before, 25,000 is allocated for senior transportation, another 5,000 for the Alzheimer's Center and another 5,000 for health and wellness uh, programs for individuals 62 and over. And then the Community Foundation of Broward Grant, which is an Age of Dignity grant, that particular grant uh, is called Fostering Awareness. Their major emphasis, because in Broward County, the fastest growing segment of our population is 85 plus. This grant was specifically for people 80 and over. We did a, um, and we're just finishing up this grant, uh, cheer yoga class, caregiver uh, support group later in the afternoons for caregivers to partake in, as well as a music therapy program and multicultural type activities and entertainment for the Alzheimer's Daycare Center. And then the Northeast Focal Point Concert Board, which is a private nonprofit, uh, 501c3, assists with uh, daily operations and um, pledge $120,000 uh, for the center's operations. The next three slides are going to talk about our performance measures and specifically the performance measures I mentioned before. The supportive services through the Older Americans Act of 1965 covers our counseling um, individuals and support groups. You see fiscal year 17, what was accomplished, fiscal year 18 estimates, and then uh, fiscal year 19. <coughs> fiscal year 18 estimates are listed based on what has been accomplished so far, which is about 148 groups. 1,444 people in attendance. Our goal for 18 actually is 300 groups, which is represented in uh, upcoming goal because as I showed you before, there's no change in the money. So we're not going to be increasing um, you know, the number of people because we only have one licensed mental health counselor. And we're anticipating about 1,200 people in attendance for the upcoming year. Education and training in 2000. Uh, 17, we accomplished 225 outreach education and trainings, whether it be at the center or outside of the campus. And right now, uh, which should be the first eight months of this year, it was 102, and our goal for this year is 175, as well as for 2019, fiscal year 2000, fiscal year 19, excuse me. Health support, health and uh, wellness and promotion, uh, individuals and groups. In 17, it was 316 groups. Uh, 7,537 people in attendance, a little bit lower in this area. Um, we have 157 groups thus far, but the attendance has been um, quite popular. Again, I'd say to the name change for the Center for Active Aging and people wanting to stay healthy, well, independent, and uh, fall prevention and staying engaged with physical fitness exercise programs. Again, the goal this year is 350,000, uh, uh, 350 groups, excuse me, and the attendance we'll be looking at is about 7,500. Outreach, um, last year we had 50. We're looking to hire an outreach coordinator. We've had 19 so far for the first eight months and our goal for next year will be 40. And then transportation trips uh, based on the various transportation opportunities that we have. Uh, we currently have a little over 58,000 trips for the first eight months and our goal is about 80,000 for this year and also for next year. 
uh, recreation uh, leisure recreation leisure um, as well as creative and fitness programs are fortunate that our new recreation coordinator just started a couple of weeks ago so we're very excited about that um, fiscal year 18 we're 2460 hours with over 22,000 people in attendance uh, thus far this year it's 975 hours with a little over uh, 18,000 individuals in attendance and then for fiscal year 19 the goal will be 2,000 hours as well as 24,000 people in attendance. For referrals, that's referrals that either we refer to our own center as it relates to services and programs or outside services um, within the community, uh, depending on the needs. Last year we accomplished 897. This year for the first eight months, 650. Our goal for this year, fiscal year 18 as well as 19, is 900. Our social service um, appointments that we um, have with individuals and that's really anybody but primarily focused on 60 and over 90 uh, I'm sorry um, we accomplished 903 yes uh, last year currently we're at 529 and our goal will be about 925 I mentioned about the meals earlier um, and then the preschool services also we are training mentorship program for students from Kaiser University, um, FAU, FIU, Barry University, uh, nursing students, health administration students. Uh, in addition, we have a multitude of volunteer opportunities on our campus. And this slide, uh, the performance measure specifically, tells you about our Allison and Daycare Center. And I'm just, in the interest of time, going to, to just indicate right now, we presently, in the last eight months, have served 62 individuals and their caregivers with over 33,000 hours of services and the goal um, next year will be about 60. Fortunately, we didn't re sustain the cuts, so we'll be able to continue to maintain our services at the level that we have been. Uh, the same thing for case management as well as caregiver training and support and in our multicultural daycare center, that's a small program. We're actually funded for about 10 and currently we have 11 um, individuals. And then screening and assessment, um, <coughs> you'll see that's a little bit lower and primarily because um, the Department of Elder Affairs and Aging and Disability Resource Center has uh, revised the way that we um, accomplish those goals. The next couple of slides will just primarily talk about our program and service enhancements. We're going to continue to develop community partnerships with various organizations, maintain and expand our existing um, public-private partnerships, continue to promote uh, education and training for our wonderful uh, team of professionals that we work with, and uh, most importantly, continued education and advocacy with local legislators um, regarding the value and importance of our funding and how it impacts the lives of individuals specifically that have Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. We'll be expanding our volunteer opportunities um, with more professional uh, individuals that are now um, getting into uh, retire, going into the next chapter of their life after they have retired. We'll also continue to develop joint activities and program along with shared space between the Center for Active Aging and Parks and Rec. We've already started to do that with the aquatics pool on Tuesdays and Thursdays, as well as a couple of dances that we've had at some of the community centers, but more so as we continue to plan for our redevelopment project. We'll continue to assess our programs to meet the changing needs of our community, and we will continue to research and plan uh, to apply for various grant opportunities. We're very happy to have Maria Carmen on board so that we can continue to sustain our services and continue to enhance the delivery of our services. We'll also expand our intergenerational programs and we'll continue with ongoing mentorship programs and our evidence-based studies. Uh, we're partnered with FAU, Frigia Yoga, and Osteoarthritis. There was just um, an article out about that related to maybe it's just a chair in yoga that we can help somebody's pain that has arthritis and we're working now with an FAU study on nutrition related to um, the value of protein. I'm sorry, the next, well, we're gonna, this particular slide, I'm gonna actually elaborate on this page, which primarily shows you the different divisions within the Department of Active Aging, which is administration. Um, you'll see an increase of 14.8%. That primarily accounts for what was mentioned earlier uh, by our city manager, the community participation through the Aging and Disability Resource Center. 
um, as well as the Northeast Focal Point Constant Board, made up about set big up about seventy-two thousand that dollars. So really, in that area, really went up about four percent. But the community participation from those two areas are now part of the Department of Active Aging. The Center for Active Aging is a negative twenty-two point seven percent. However, as, as I mentioned earlier, the transportation division was taken from the Center for Active Aging, formerly the Senior Center, it now has their own division under transportation, and that is up 16.8%. Uh, so in actuality, between those two, it actually has gone down um, approximately 7%. The awesome is Dacre Center uh, percent change from 18-19 is 5.1%, um, and then the preschool 2.5%, and the insurance costs have gone up a little bit under the um, non-departmental, which is 2.3%. So overall, from the fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19, the request, uh, request is 0. Point, I'm sorry, 0.038%, which is $1,216. This slide primarily talks about the annual budget for fiscal year 19, which is uh, $3,186,459. And you'll see some of the revenue source, approximately $900,000 from intergovernmental um, resources, uh, 78000 for uh, outside some areas that we can charge or feed for services, miscellaneous revenue of 227000 and then the city uh, general, re general fund at $1.5 million with a cash carryover of $482,000. I'm almost wrapping up. Um, the infrastructure um, redevelopment project, which is of course one of the goals of the great city of Deerfield Beach, um, we're very excited for the design and build and working with Walter Zakari and Associates. This is one of the preliminary renderings that uh, is up on the slide. Our goal will always be to remain operational throughout the project and phase in the project and working again with joint parks and recreation, joint activities and program with parks and recreation. Um, and we certainly thank the City of Deerfield Beach for the $12 million revenue bond and the CASA board has uh, committed $100,000 for interior, in, interior furnishings. And thank you for a bright new day and a bright future for the Center for Active Aging, particularly as the population continues to age in Broward County. Um, we will see those people that are 55 to 65, be 65 to 75, and so on and so forth. Um, and any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. You may have addressed this, and I may not have heard it. But um, when we're talking about the performance measures, and, you know, it seemed like uh, there was a trend that, in 2017, we were able to do more than we were able to do in 18, but then you hope that in 19, we're going to get back to a little bit more like 17, and even a little bit more than 17. So is there a, a reason for the dip in most of the, I can't even read them on actually, this little page. Actually, most of it is only because it's eight months. We've only gave you from October 1 for eight months. So oh. it's not a full year. But the goal that you see in fiscal year 19 is actually the goal that we hope to accomplish. And I strongly believe that with our team of uh, wonderful professionals, we'll be able to accomplish that goal. OK, so yeah, two thirds really of the year. Not less, we gave you <coughs> what we've accomplished so far. The estimate will be with the 2019. So for example, in this slide uh, for recreation, the goal will be um, 2,000 hours. Uh, that, that's probably one of the only ones we may not be able to accomplish because we haven't had a recreation coordinator. Um, but the others, the referrals, we're at 650 right now, and the goal is 900, so we should be able to accomplish that. Okay, so I'm really not comparing apples and apples. I'm comparing two thirds of a basket to a full basket. The Correct. whole year. Correct. Okay. We gave you what was actually accomplished as of June 1st, October 1 to June 1st, ended okay. on Friday. Okay, that helps me understand that. Thank you. Certainly. Sorry for the confusion. Commissioner, anyone else? Commissioner Drosky. Can you um, go back to the grants slide, please? It's number seven in your presentation. Mm -hmm. The grants? It says it shows grants here, I'm sorry. 
There we go. It takes a time. On the, the first line going across into the comments, is that really a 12 passenger Toyota? No, that was a mistake. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. It's actually one 16 passenger bus with two wheelchair tie downs, one 12 passenger bus with two wheelchair tie downs, and the Toyota Corolla. I thought it was like a clown car. I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry about that. That was a. I, I, I wish that was the only question that I had. Can you talk a little bit sure. about the challenges you're having? You touched on a little bit uh, with state funding in particular. Uh, I know this was an especially challenging year for you. Can you touch on that just a little bit you know, more um, in, in depth for those that may be attending tonight? C certainly. I, you know, as we all know, times are changing. Uh, but I truly believe there is a bright new future ahead for us, not only with the new building, but with other opportunities, whether it be with uh, grant opportunities, community partnerships. Um, the federal government money has primarily has stayed the same. The state money is always a challenge, particularly as it relates to money that's non-reoccurring. And our Alzheimer's um, disease initiative funding through the state, due to various changes that have happened, and we had a very challenging year um, statewide as it relates to the various hurricanes that impacted everywhere in our entire state, as it relates to the tragedy that happened at Mar Mar Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, the fact that we do need um, more security and safety at schools. We were one of three different Alzheimer's, um, and, and you know, top-notch Alzheimer's centers, I will have to say, within the state of Florida that unfortunately sustained cuts. It was $195,150. We um, went, of course, to the Aging and Disability Resource Center um, to see if they can come up with some money. Also went to the CASA board. I know the commission, particularly uh, maybe Bill Gantz, has been very supportive with his legislative connections throughout the state. This just happened like that overnight. Um, we had caregivers that typically call. It was just something that we didn't know that was going to, to happen. It happened. We will be very vigilant as we always have and be proactive. We'll be working with the Rubin Group, our lobbyists, starting in September. Uh, we will be going to um, Tallahassee to advocate for the funding. We're meeting with people locally, um, but it depends on what the priority is and, and the, the emphasis is. And unfortunately, what we have seen is people occasionally do not understand the impact of Alzheimer's disease or that older people just need a little help or a little safety net in order for them to co continue to remain at home in the community with supportive services and to remain independent rather than placing them into a facility which can cost upward to about $72,000 a year. So I think it's an education advocacy process uh, that needs to happen. I will have to say the CASA board as well as the Aging and Disability Resource Center was you know, happy to uh, give us additional support, and I know that the city manager also had asked that for from the city commission if that cut did come through. But we, it's going to be an ongoing uphill battle. Uh, there was just a report that was put out by three major funders in Broward County, Community Foundation of Broward, Jewish Federation, as well as the United Way of Broward County, as it relates to the Silver to Sami, related to um, the fact that we need to have a stronger safety net to help people, that we're gonna see more and more people that are gonna be socially isolated, and as well as um, they're on limited, res have li limited resources uh, for, s for services. So we need to build up a better safety net. And I think we're gonna see a lot more grant opportunities from those private foundations, rather than from the government, that we should have accessibility. We already have built those relationships. We have a successful track record. Um, the Community Foundation uh, grant that I mentioned this evening is for 45000 for fostering awareness, specifically for people 80 and over. However, we, the first grant we ever got with them was 20000 or 25000 or 12000 and every year we've been able to increase it. So I don't know if I answered your question. And, and then some, yes. I, okay. I appreciate the additional detail. <coughs> In the last, uh, I think it's the last, well, it's not the last slide, the, the numbers slide, the one, two, three, four, fifth from last. This one? Yes, correct. Okay. Now, your budget wasn't broken out that way last year, correct? So it's kind of hard to match it up apples to apples, but the, the bottom line at the bottom there is that it's a less than 1% increase. Is that correct? 
That is correct. And if you go back to this slide, if I go back to this slide, I know I went through it quickly. You see the Center for Active Aging, formerly the Senior Center. We had uh, transportation, which was a much smaller transportation uh, division primarily for people over the age of 60 in the senior population. Then we, in fiscal year 18, we added the transportation division. So it's almost kind of a little bit of a, a wash, but not really, because we took on a couple employees from Parks and Rec and we're doing all the transportation for all ages, um, whether it be the, the college tours, whether it be the after school program, the special events, and so on and so forth. So to answer your question, yes, there is a 0.03% uh, increase of a little over $1,200. But I think the slide before it, the, the bar graph shows, kind of puts it into perspective, so. But that's it, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, just on that, I'm sorry. Mayor Gans. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the reason why we moved transportation and the buses under uh, uh, Center for Active Aging is to get rid of redundancy of management. It's better to just have one central source for all of our transportation needs. And again, it's what um, Ms. Petty was talking about stitching together these departments where they don't look like, well, I need my own transportation because I'm Parks and Rec and this is for summer camp. So that's part of the reason why we did that. And there, even though we moved them from parks, there really wasn't an increase in the overall general fund budget. Everything remains static um, when we did the, that this current fiscal year. Sorry, Vice that's Mayor. That's okay. <coughs> Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, two things. Certainly. One, my, uh, how come at my age I can't do that cheer yoga? You can do that cheer yoga because in addition to the grant, we have a cheer yoga for people that are just 60 and over. And I, oh, good. you're always welcome. Good, thank you. Next thing is, I've been talking with, I um, can't remember his name, Transportation Czar for Broward County. Chris Walton, Mr. Chris Walton. Chris Walton, about bus shelter. And I'd like to see us move forward on that this year because if nothing makes me uh, madder than on a, a hot day or rainy day, I have seniors waiting on the bus where there is no shelter. Case in point, at the corner of 15th and Dixie Highway, I know there's a city bus shelter there, but our bus stops and there are old people sitting on little carts or whatever. And I talked to Chris and I told him not only on his line, but he should be able to help us, and he agreed. He should be able to help us to get some bus shelters because he does provide us with buses to go around the neighborhood buses. And so if we could look into that to see where we need, um, and maybe it'll come up uh, on the air, on the air tour, I don't know, where we need some, some shelters so that people, uh, the, the elderly, can stand out and wait on the transportation to come. Correct, and certainly we I, can. Actually, I'm sorry, sure. Donna, I can no, just right. answer that quickly because Eric just shot me an email. So yeah, we're already working with the Broward County Transit with uh, Ms. Wal Mr. Walton on that and, and also Tom Good. So okay. when you met with me about a month ago, they took it over. So sorry, Donna, but no uh, problem. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We actually have added more bus stops for that reason, and the main thing with the shelters and the bus benches, and I know that, that Eric and Tom are both working on that, um, is we just need to make sure that it's safe. Yes. Because at that particular location we've gone out to look at it, it's not safe the way that it is, but it's also not safe or protective for them without having a shelter. Right. So you're 100% correct. Okay. So thank we're you. working in that direction. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Can we go to the next slide, please? Sure. So, um, Based on some of the movement that happened with the transportation, still transportation is down, correct? There's been a decrease in the transportation budget? No. Is that what I'm understanding? Because it was pulled out of the Center for Active Aging, right? It was pulled out of the Center for Active Aging, but that budget did not go down. Okay. Um, when we transferred over last, last year, we needed to transfer over, um, we transferred the personnel. However, we needed to transfer over some of the costs. Okay. Um, has the uh, has the request for more transportation for our vulnerable population out there increased, or is it decreased? 
the so, request uh, uh, to clarify in case I, I wasn't clear and I apologize areas like the palms and places like that that have while they're in circulation with transportation um, has there been a re I've heard a great deal of requests that, that we need more transportation for, for our vulnerable population um, is that accurate is that what you're hearing also or, or do you feel that we're we're kind of maintaining status quo there's always more needs for transportation we provide transportation to all the government housing facilities in DFO Beach every hour in the hour Monday through Friday occasionally there are special requests that come through when special requests come through of that nature usually it ends up being a fee for service because we can't just say we're going to provide transportation for you without opening it up for everybody else that's in the community so we have had some of those different requests. We try to accommodate them on one of our transportation um, buses that we already have a funding source for. Okay. Um, I would be inclined to increase the transportation budget to be able to service more people because the need is there from what, from during the hurricane, as we get out more into the community and start talking to people out there, that need is there. So. Um, that's something, maybe not this budget, but certainly something I'd like to take a look at what the demand is compared to what we're able to, to meet in our current budget and, and potentially um, increase the budget for that coming up because I, I think the need is there. And that's something I've heard loud and clear. The number one need in Broward County for any uh, senior is transportation. Number two is affordable housing. So absolutely, there is definitely a need there. We've been fortunate to be able to meet uh, the majority of the needs in Broward County. I know we're looking into a surtax to even add some more community bus um, shuttles. We have two now: the DFL Beach Express one and two. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, actually, if yes. I could just again, while this division did increase subsequent in the general fund and parks and recreation, I just want to make sure that went down for transportation over there so it shifted um, just quickly um, not to be uh, Debbie Downer here but there are a couple policy issues for future consideration that Commission will potentially have to take after fiscal year 20 or so and that's dealing with the preschool I know that uh, Mr. Franzo has brought it up in the past about we seem to have decline in uh, and the enrollment there so that's an area that you just need to keep in the back of your mind that if the costs are not there to sustain it you're either gonna have to increase from somewhere else to make up that difference the other thing is again I I don't like bringing this up but you know I feel obligated that I have to due to what's happening with the town of Hillsborough Beach um, especially with what they just did to us uh, late last week with another it, trying to uh, submit a second opposition and uh, which further extends the artificial reef and I apologize for the public because this we've not talked about this because this is litigation but once again I know that Ms. DeFranzo uh, with the Northeast Focal Point and her board um, and she's went to them and they really want to continue to have it have the uh, cuisine of the region at the Hillsborough Yacht Club and I feel that that is probably the only commercial tax base that the town of Hillsborough Beach has and just feel obligated that you know from the staff from my perspective they're going to be suing us later this year the town of Hillsborough Beach over an uh, issue that clearly has nothing and again I won't get into it Anthony but that can cost us in excess of two and a half million dollars now they are playing games with our ability to put in an artificial reef which is nowhere near this area and that may cost us a grant and Mr. Gressick and Mr. Bards tomorrow night in their presentation will talk about that. So I brought this up last year and I, what I'd like is at least some direction from the city commission so I can go meet with her board with Ms. DeFranzo 
to say, yeah, go ahead and have it there, or no, we don't want to have it there. And again, I hate bringing it up in this venue, but this is a policy consideration for the budget. Any other commission comments for department? No. no? Just, um, just one comment, Ms. Anita. I understand, and, um, and, and, and Vicki, um, you should be aware of this if you, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not already aware. Broward County has decided that for three-year-olds, they're not, no longer going to allow them to go into school at three years old like they do now. And that may have an impact on your program in terms of an increase in children. So we need to prepare for that. If that is what, well, it's not if that is what, that is what they're going to do. They have slapped their three-year-old program. So you may, you know, want to um, see what's on, on the horizon and how we can help those children out. Will do. Uh, Mr. Franzo, the, the decline in the preschool numbers does that have to, what do you think the reason for that is? Is that the competition with BPK? Is that, quite frankly, the condition of our facilities that doesn't make it appealing for people that want to bring people there? Or, or what do you think the reason is for the, for the decline in the preschool numbers? I believe that it's competition. And we don't have a state-of-the-art facility, um, although anybody that brings their children to the preschool are very happy with the services and the programs and the exposure that they get to various uh, populations. We're very culturally diverse as well as intergenerationally diverse um, campus. Uh, in my opinion, having been there and seen the graduations and the people who participate, uh, you do an outstanding job with your yeah. program. The facility is something that I would imagine as someone who's looking to bring their child there, they're going to take a look at it and realize that uh, they would prefer something that's um, in the 20th, <laughs> 21st century. Uh, compared to what we have. So um, uh, we hope that, that while we understand that the, the numbers might be down now, we, uh, I believe that a new facility is going to go, um, go a long way to making people feel comfortable about having their children there. Well, let me just clarify the new, for the new um, Department of Active Aging facility, we're not anticipating having a preschool. In that, in, in that okay. particular building, uh, the hope is as we continue to, um, you know, just as transportation has become more efficient and effective in serving the needs of our population related to the quality of life, um, one of the goals of, of the City Commission, I believe the same thing will happen specifically, possibly at um, the Peter <coughs> McKee complex with the new Johnny Tigna building. Um, and we still will be providing transportation as well as having an opportunity for them there. And I could see even more and more uh, field trips between the seniors and uh, all ages, not just the three year olds, <coughs> primarily for the four and five year olds, because that's what VPK covers. But I think all ages. So um, the new building will not be having an intergenerational, uh, will not be having a preschool, but we will continue to do intergenerational programs. So, so you know, so what we're building there, that, that really won't impact <coughs> that. We can't look to see our numbers go up for a new facility then. So you're not going to have I, a program. I would see an increase in the number of uh, older people that will be participating sure. <laughs> and, of course, the number of people that will be volunteering. Um, but as it relates to the, the preschool, the, there's no plan, there's, there's not any plans currently um, in the new building for a preschool. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, this is if you're looking for direction yep. for when it comes to the uh, cuisine of the region, I, I, I think I don't like to get into the parochial point of view as well. They did this, let's do this back and forth. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. For the most part, you know, the people get feathers ruffled. We have good relationships with our neighboring cities, Pompano, Boca Raton, Coconut Creek. This is an exception. Um, and in this particular case, um, it, it, I understand the city manager's point, and while I'm normally not inclined to go along with that, I did have discussions with members of that board last year when we were looking to uh, uh, request a, a location change that we said, let's do it for this year, but we need to consider a new location for, next, for this upcoming year. Um, I would hope they would still hold to that and be looking at alternatives. There are a lot of fine places in Deerfield Beach we can have, and I understand it's a unique location, but considering the current atmosphere the way it is, 
um, I, I, it makes sense for us to, to want to support businesses in our, in, in our community uh, and, and look at things a little bit different for that, for that city and how we interact with them. Understood. Okay. Thank you. That's just my opinion, so I don't know else feels. Thank you, Don. Okay, thank you very much. So at the risk of uh, uh, committing death by PowerPoint, I'm going to try and uh, go through the slides quickly and get to the, the meat of the, the presentation tonight. So uh, we're going to talk about a department overview, our, our a few accomplishments, uh, highlight a few performance measures, our budget overview, and then some future considerations uh, that we'd like to bring up tonight. So just to briefly talk about our divisions, um, uh, we're comprised of the administration and community events division, that division is combined. We have our parks maintenance, which is our largest division, it takes care of all our parks and meetings and the public right of way. Uh, athletics and aquatics uh, is Ryan's division that oversees all the sports activities and also the aquatic center. Uh, our recreation division uh, handles uh, programming at all our community centers to oversee the tennis center um, and also the teen center uh, and also summer camp. Don't forget about summer camp. Uh, then we have our waterfront pier uh, division and then finally our cemetery division. As uh, Ms. Petty said earlier today, we do everything from uh, birth to burial, if you want to look at it in our department. Um, so that's, that's all the divisions that we, that we have in our department. Uh, just highlight quickly our inventory. Um, you, most of you have seen this uh, before. The only thing I want to sort of highlight on here is that uh, we now have seven fitness station parks. That's one of the, one of the accomplishments this year. Uh, we've gone from uh, four to three this year. So we've uh, added one at Villages, one at uh, OMRC, and one at Southeast Second Street Park. Um, and so uh, we've hit our compliment on, on those fitness stations, and they seem to be very, very popular. So let's talk a little bit about some fiscal year accomplishments. Um, top of the list is obtaining $2 million in grants to begin work on the Brand Hill to Richardson Knowles Memorial Park. And I hope some of you have gone by there to take a look at the progress that has been made in the, on that uh, property over there. We're really excited about that. Uh, we hope to complete that this by the end of uh, this, or the beginning of uh, fiscal year 19. Um, we also did a re-landscaping of the East Hillsborough Corridor in the cold, uh, and place some extra emphasis uh, on uh, landscaping uh, the ent city entry points. Uh, we thought that was important to do a monuments and landscaping for when people are coming into the city. We did three new playgrounds this year. Uh, as I mentioned, three new fitness stations. Uh, we also did an expansion of our park ranger program. We now have it fully staffed, uh, five, or budgeted for five rangers that we can now run two shifts, seven days a week, uh, which is a big benefit to what we're doing. Uh, some of the other accomplishments, the events out west. We had two major events out west, which is one of the, um, the directors from the commission. Uh, we had Boots and Bourbon Country Music Festival out at Choir Waters Park over 2,000 in attendance at, at that event. Um, our sip and stroll that occurred out at the Arboretum at, uh, at Constitution Park sold out. The tickets, we, we, it was a paid event and it was sold out and it was a tremendous night and a great first, uh, first shot out the door for that, that event. Uh, our event sponsorship continues to grow. Uh, the, the amount of money we're coming in for event sponsorship is up over 40% uh, thus far this year and it continues to climb. Um, also, one of the things I want to announce is a new event that's coming up uh, in our August, our Big Buck Music event. Uh, we are very fortunate to be in a partnership with uh, South Florida's own DJRE, who's going to come in and help us to produce this world-class music event over at Ovita McKeithen uh, Recreational Complex. Um, we're excited about what's going to happen. There's something that we've been working on for quite a bit. Uh, you'll be hearing more information about who's performing and all that. Uh, the, uh, all the things that Allie's been working very, very hard to, to bring together. But we're real excited about having that event. Uh, it's going to be the first one, and we really like the idea of the Big Buck uh, Music Festival. So uh, we hope you'll be looking forward to that. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few programming highlights this year, because uh, it's a big part of what it is that we do. Uh, this year we added some uh, enhancement programs to our after school program. So in addition to doing after school, you could also sign up for an enhancement enrichment program. So we offer swim lessons, we offer tennis lessons. We also are offered archery. And we had several students signed up to learn to 
to, uh, what is it, arch? <laughs> <laughs> to, to shoot a bow in there, I guess is the, is the proper term. <laughs> um, and that's a picture you see some of the kids out there at the, uh, at the park learning. Uh, and they got pretty good at it, and, and the staff took uh, uh, three of our youth out to a tournament in Deerfield Beach, and all three placed. We had a first, second, and a fourth. Uh, and they're so excited about it, we're gonna expand the program, and we're looking to actually host a tournament here in Deerfield Beach uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, we enhanced special needs program. Uh, one of the things we believe, we, want, we believe in social equity. We wanna make sure that everyone has equal opportunity uh, for recreation uh, in this city. Uh, so we, we had our first uh, special needs buddy summer camp this year. Um, and uh, I, I got a very, very wonderful email from a parent uh, just thanking the staff for, for doing this. And she had not seen her son come home and smile and be happy because he never had any friends. That's what she shared with me. But through the, the summer camp, um, he has made friends. And so that's what we don't want to deprive anyone. So that's, that's the big thing that we're going to continue to, to focus on. Our teens have a new program at the Teen Center, uh, Concept to Creation. It's a program that allows teens to design and then manufacture their own t-shirts. Um, the idea is that we want to not just teach them recreation club, but teach them some skills that they can use and develop as they grow. Uh, we hope to see a couple of uh, entrepreneurs come out of that group. Um, Hugh has started a new walking club at the beach for adults, 50 years and over, correct? 50 plus, yes. 50 plus walking club. Um, and it's going to uh, meet on the weekends, and uh, he has decided to ask that he wanted to have celebrity uh, leaders for the walkers. So I'm just letting our commission know that they expect a call from us to, to come out and lead one of our walks on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm not 50 yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. And I also want to highlight our continued robotic and cold tech classes. We'll be offering cold tech classes right here at Europe for Tech uh, this coming fall. So there's just a few highlights. Let's go over a few of our uh, performance measures. Um, one of the ones I want to highlight is our program satisfaction. It's a new measure for us that we want to know how we're doing. Uh, so we're surveying those who are taking our programs and attending our events. Uh, and we, we, ha we have an estimate this year that we're going to hit 85% customer satisfaction for our programs. Our goal is 90%, but our long-term goal is to get to 95%. That's, that's, I want it to be our baseline. For, uh, everything that we do, uh, we want to have a 95% satisfaction rate. I also like to highlight that our rentals are continuing to increase, uh, partly due to this new facility we have here, and it's also uh, you know, created an increase in our revenue, which uh, I'll touch on just late, uh, a little bit later. Um, talk about our city sponsored core events. Those, those events continue to rise. We anticipate getting up to 108 this year, on uh, a target of 110. Um, we may be capped out without some additional funding, uh, but that's one of the things that we're gonna be working towards uh, in terms of sponsorship for those kind of events. Um, our peer visits, I wanna highlight that. I, I had really anticipated a, a bigger drop in attendance at the pier. As most of you know, the T was damaged during Hurricane Irma and was shut down. And, uh, we got it back up and finally got it fully operated again. Uh, so the attendance has started to climb back up, uh, partly because Pompano Beach is here went under renovation. Um, so a lot, we have a lot of those visitors come from Pompano came down to us as, as now residents. Um, but we're starting to see the attendance starting to track back up. We actually think we might surpass what we had anticipated uh, when it first shut down. So uh, I want to give some credit to Hugh and his staff over there for um, keeping the, keep pushing them over there at, at the pier. Um, I'm going to grant funding, I want to highlight that. This year we uh, $568,000 uh, increase over last year. That was primarily due to the funding we received from uh, the CBG, CDBG grant funding to put the new uh, playground over at Johnny McKeithen Park, which, will, which we're hoping to do ribbon cutting in the next couple of weeks, which will be the first park we put in that has a special needs amenity. There's a swing in that park on the playground specifically designed for special needs children, those who do not have the physical capability to hold a swing. They have never been able to experience what most children experience in a swing. Those children will be able to experience that at Johnny McKeithen once we open that, that playground. Now, we have a ton more performance measures, but I just wanted to highlight you those uh, tonight. 
Uh, so talk a little bit about the budget. Our budget consists of overall reduction of 1% from the current fiscal year. Uh, it's about a, a net of about $123,488. Um, I did want to highlight some of the line items where we took some decreases from. Uh, but the big jump was in park maintenance, uh, 619000 uh, for park amenities and equipment purchases. We've been fortunate at Deerfield Beach over the last four years to completely turn over all of our park facilities. We put in new playgrounds, new benches, new equipment, but we're at the point now to begin to pull some of that back and do a more incremental replacement each year. Uh, so we felt it was time to sort of bring some of those dollars back and repurpose them uh, elsewhere. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we didn't, uh, that the budget was a, a true accurate budget um, and not just inflate numbers, for want of a better word. Uh, so we, we, we reduced that. Now we were still having money to do some playground replacements uh, and some vehicle replacements. It just won't be as large as we've done in the past. Uh, we uh, reduced some direct expense to community events, uh, about $69,000. Um, hopeful, hopeful that sponsorship would help to compensate for some of that, um, that reduction. And we also reduced summer camp for over $100,000, and that was for two reasons. One, we no longer have to operate a camp at Quiet Waters Elementary School. The school system is operating the camp, so that we don't have to staff that camp. Uh, and two, we have a hybrid model now for summer camp. It's, it's meaning we have some camps that we run in-house with staff, some we run with contractors and, and professional instructors, which cost us a lot less money to operate. So we're still going to be serving the same amount of kids, it's just that we don't have to do it, spend quite as much money to get it done. Some of the line item increases I want to highlight. Um, we did have to add to the budget the $36,000 in landscape media maintenance for the new FDOT project. FDOT is a, installing new medians uh, that run from Dixie Highway East to Federal. Uh, if you've seen those going in at some point soon, they're going to turn those over for our maintenance, so we got to add the cost of that for our budget. Uh, we're also funding some additional dollars for park plans for Pioneer Trail and for Camel Shanter. And Pioneer Trail actually is what we're calling uh, our, our hope, our vision is to have a link park system from Riverview to Pioneer to Grand Hill to Richardson Knowles. So we want to sort of plan that out together rather than do it um, individually. Uh, the idea that we've been talking since I've been here with Eric and, and the city manager about having a link park system. And so that's, we feel this is the best opportunity to actually get started in doing that. Uh, I'm sorry, David. Yes. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, just quickly for those that may not know, because many people don't know that we have Riverview Park, which was deeded to the county several decades ago. It's on the Hillsborough River, just a little to the northwest of Pioneer uh, Park. So when he's talking about Riverview Park, it, it's right now it's just undeveloped land on the Hillsborough River. Yeah, sorry. Just like just the northeast yeah. Sixth Court, I believe, is where, yeah. where it sits. Just a little. All right, thank you for that. Doc Miller. Uh, in addition, we're going to be investing uh, $60,000 to redo the field at the Ovita McKeithen this year and also some improvements to Pineview Cemetery uh, to do some uh, uh, repair work to the monuments and the structures over there to do some automation of the, the data. So those are the things that we're sort of highlighting for increases this year. So we'll take a look at the budget. Um, as I mentioned, it's the overall 1% reduction from FY18. Um, administration and community events uh, has a change of plus 9.2 percent. As been mentioned before, primarily that's increase in personnel costs and uh, health care, but it's also a right sizing of overtime. We budget overtime for every community event that we do, and we've sort of overspent that the last couple years, so we want to right size the budget, so that was increased to make sure that we're budgeting correctly for that. Uh, the, the big reduction is in the park maintenance budget, as I mentioned. Uh, previously, and like the majority of that is that we just will not be funding for those major developments and equipment purchases um, this coming year. Um, athletics and aquatics, uh, slight re a reduction, um, and then recreation, uh, same. Summer camp, as I mentioned, is a 20% reduction, but that's due to that reduction of, of how we're operating for summer camp uh, this year. Here has a, shows a, a change of 17.9% increase. A lot of that is the, the new um, 
that were nothing to do with the health care costs, and also we're converting to part-time peer attendance to a full-time assistant waterfront manager uh, to assist out in the operations of, of the pier and the waterfront. Um, I think most of you know it's a seven-day operation, uh, 24 hours a day during the weekend, and we just have one full-time manager out there. Uh, and that person is also responsible for managing the, the Deerfield Beach Cafe contract and also the beach amenity contract. And so we felt it was best use of those dollars to have a full-time person who can assist on the off shifts to keep an eye on what's going on rather than the part-time staff. So that attributes to part of the, the increase. Um, the cemetery, although it shows a 21% increase, uh, the amount of money is not that large. But it is for the, the 20 plus thousand dollars for the increase and for the cost in personnel and the COLA and the health care, how it's allocated. And uh, our revenue, um, we are projecting an increase in revenue. We're trending uh, about 5% ahead this year over last year. Uh, so we're going to uh, project a little higher for FY19. The increase is primarily due to uh, the increase in facility rentals and for uh, uh, admissions and for uh, resales at the pier. Uh, the merchandise resale operation is going really, really well at the, at the pier. Uh, I think uh, for our budget, we should be at around 70 some odd percent, I think, uh, spent or earned in both those line items are in the 90s of, of catching, of, of receiving money at the current. So we anticipate that as an increase as well. So for FY19, what do we have planned? Um, as I mentioned, we got to take over maintenance of the new medians on, on Hillsboro. Uh, we're looking forward to the completion of the Brand Hilda Richardson Knowles Memorial Park. Uh, we'll be adding a dedicated maintenance position specifically for that park. It won't be the new cost. We will not be hiring any new staff. We'll be getting the staff to be reallocated from another department uh, to give us that FTE. Uh, we will start the planning, planning process for Pioneer and Tambo Shandler Parks. Um, we sent out a press release today that we will also begin to, as a customer service measure, we'll begin uh, selling beach parking stickers at our recreation facilities to give uh, residents more options to purchase uh, rather than just going to City Hall. Um, this past year, we spent a lot of time in getting our rec track system squared away up and running. Rec track is our registration system for collecting money, registering um, participants, doing uh, rentals. So we're moving over to what we call the main track side, which is where, how we track what we do with our maintenance staff. Uh, so that system will be getting upgrades this coming year. And one of the things we're we'll be implementing is a mobile application for field staff. So that staff in the field will be able to, with their phone, city issued cell phone, be able to record hours worth, record the data for what's going on, submit work orders. Uh, so we're going to need to uh, bring them in just to complete that kind of information or to even buy more computers. We'll just be able to do it from their cell phone. Um, we have about uh, 16 new bike racks that will be going up on the beach this year. Um, as I mentioned about the accessible swings that we're doing at Johnny McKeithen, we're going to do three additional parks and put the same amenity there uh, at uh, Crystal Heights South Villages, and I believe Mayo Howard is the third one that we're going to be having. So we're going to have them all around the city uh, for people with uh, children who have special needs. Um, we're going to do a playground and shade upgrade at Crystal Heights Park. That will be the last park, so we've done the complete rotation of upgrading our parks. Um, and then a new pickleball court is going in at Southeast, that should be Southeast 19th Avenue Park. Um, and it's a partnership with uh, the Deerfield Beach, uh, Deerfield Beach Island Community Association. They're going to help us fund to build the new pickleball park out there. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'll be converting two part-time positions to a full-time assistant uh, waterfront peer manager uh, to assist in the operations out there. Future considerations. Uh, I know fees is always a dirty word, but uh, I got to bring it up. Um, we need to take a look, continue to we'll continue to put focus on our, on our user fees. We still need to bring a lot, many of them up to market rate. Um, we're still behind in many, many areas. One of the things I'd like for you to consider is, you know, currently we do not charge a fee for Sullivan Park and the pavilion rental. When the park was open, the decision was made not to charge a fee. Uh, but it is so popular, we're taking reservations anyway. Uh, we had over 63 reservations thus 
well, last fiscal year, uh, and we're probably trending higher than that for this year. If we only get one reservation per week at $250 per reservation, we could raise about $12,000 revenue. Um, so that's something we'd like to, to consider doing. Um, we'd also like to consider some admission for some events. You know, of course, not, not our big 4th of July or anything like that, but we've, we've seen that the uh, Boots and Bourbon and that the Sip and Stroll, uh, people paying for the, but it does work. Uh, people do pay for them. Uh, we would not charge for you know, our small community events, but certain events we'd like to be able to consider uh, charging admission for to help cover some of the costs. And now it's not all about the fees. It's also, we also like to consider um, how do we help those who can't afford to pay. Uh, so we'd like to develop this coming year a fee assistance policy or program um, to help those. Uh, and you know, that sort of ties into my last bullet point, is the official partnership program. I think I'd like for us to consider having a overall partnership program for the city. Our department, I don't have no problem in taking that on, but I think it could be multiple departments all across the city, something that we can brand and market to give people an opportunity, whether it's to adopt a park, adopt a median, to sponsor events, programs, to help with uh, program costs for kids who may have, may be struggling to, um, to take part in the program. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be a great thing if we could we could market that, we could brand that, and create something. Um, and, I, and I have no problem trying to spearhead that. That's something we want to take a look at. We do quite a bit, but it's sort of haphazard. And you know, we'll talk to people as we see them, or we go after specific. But if we could put together something that's really, really nice that we can sort of market to not just the business community, but the not-for-profits, uh, something I'd like for us to uh, consider. Um, and I just want to say this, that. Um, I know fees were always tough, you know, that's the issue, but, but when, you, when you look at Deerfield Beats as it relates to um, national standards, you know, we recover in Parks and Recreation about 11% of our costs through fees and charges. The national standard is about 33%. Uh, many, many agencies are do well above that. Um, now, I'm not saying that we should you know, jump to that, but it's something that we need to take a look at. Um, when a department is 90% is uh, subsidized through general fund, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good position to be in um, when economics go bad. So um, I'd like for us to consider that that's not necessarily a bad thing to start moving, moving in that direction. Um, and I think that's my slides. So, question. <coughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I just want to say again, uh, first of all, that I am uh, pleased with uh, the progress on uh, Brand Hill Books, uh, this Memorial Park. I, I think you do great things uh, at the park. Uh, I am totally pleased with the transformation of our teen center. Uh, we're looking at a program who a year or two ago, we had maybe 12 teens. And uh, now that has grown exponentially. And I want to say to my uh, colleagues, uh, I, I agree, you know, we need to look at some of those fees or fee structures or some of the things that we do <coughs> here in the city, especially uh, since we are down in terms of us, uh, the national standard one way or the other. But um, one of the things that I am uh, um, totally concerned about is um, I'd like to see if we could do a little bit more than the swings for our um, children with, um, you know, ha handicapping disabilities. If we could, we could work on that mm -hmm. uh, one way or the other. Um, your achievements have been uh, great uh, uh, today, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I like the vitality that you brought to the um, parks and recreation and. Uh, especially in terms of getting uh, your staff uh, to be um, uh, the morale, bringing the morale up, and that, that, that goes a long way so, uh, and says a lot about you. Thank you. What I want to 
make sure that we do have, and I know I saw Brand Hilda there um, on the screen and you mentioned that, um, and Mr. City Manager, if I have not said this to you, uh, when we open that, I have been getting calls from around the country about that park and when it's going to open. So if you don't have monies in the budget to do a real grand opening for that particular park, we ought to see about putting some dollars away so that we can really, you know, make it what it is. Well, get the, get, get the people to uh, respond uh, to that. And uh, I want to be the first one, Mr. Miller, along with Representative, uh, uh, ex-representative, state representative, Green Clark Reed. Come on now, y'all got to join in. Uh, Hugh, yes. we're coming. Okay. <laughs> we're coming out there on that pier to walk. Seriously, okay. Now y'all, come on, Bill. You're not busy, but I'm gonna be there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank I you. Appreciate that. What's the weight limit on the? <laughs> 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 I've been on this, and I think you're okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Commissioner Parnas. Uh, it's not a question. It's just an idea I'd like us to think about. You're going to be working with Tam O'Shanta Park. Yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman that brokered that deal to get us the 50 acres was Commissioner Marty Popelski. I'm going to throw out the idea that I'd like to see the park named after him, and it's just a thought for the commission to think about. Uh, he worked very hard to get us that 50 acres, and I, it's his district, District 3, which is now mine, and I think it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Commissioner Grosky. If we're gonna consider naming things, I'd consider the pickleball court for Joe Miller. So. <laughs> 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 it's a little grand, but we'll, we'll think about it. Uh, the question is on the map. In your presentation, unless I wrote the numbers down wrong, there was $800,000 in cuts. There was $170,000 in increases, which leaves, um, uh, which is around 650 million, excuse me, 650,000, uh, but you have a $123,000 overall um, reduction in your budget. So if I do the math, that's about a half a million dollars that's unaccounted for in your presentation. Right. Which means there's an extra half a million in increases. Where is that money? Majority of that is the personnel that increases. There are, what I did for you, and I can do it more specifically if you like, is give you the highlights where the increases and decreases are going to be in the current budget. We took a, a pencil to every line item in our budget increase where we thought we needed to decrease where we thought based on our uh, history of spending. <coughs> uh, so I just want to highlight to you where those, the, the, what I thought was the more important cut, but we reduce uh, uh, things like uh, uh, materials to improve. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of places that we, we sharpen our pencils and the increase was primarily in um, personnel costs. So is that half a million isn't, um, Significant number, so if you can provide more detail on sure. that, I'd appreciate that. Sure, sure, okay. That's all, thank you. All right, Commissioner Miller. A little question. The uh, bike racks at the beach, is that in addition to the current bike racks or to replace the one? Oh, no, no net more? Well, it, it will end up being net more, yes, it will be. I was hoping it'd be more total. Yeah. We got a grant to um, purchase those. In. And we got them all painted, so we'll be ready to. Couldn't we just put them and leave the ones we have to? Uh, to encourage more bicycle? I mean, we don't have, we don't want to encourage more cars. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 my first thought is, oh yeah, there's going to be addition. Then I thought, wait, it's almost that might look nicer, but if we want to encourage more bicycle traffic, me. might be an idea. Sure. Okay. Yes. I, I hear you talk about the uh, cemetery, and I know we're, 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 people are dying to get there, okay? <laughs> and uh, we're, we're, we're running out of space, um, and 
is there, I guess I should be asking the city manager, uh, is there a plan for us to deal with um, uh, the cemetery? I know I've heard people say they've gone out to um, Tamil Shanta and the cost is so prohibitive. Yeah, well unfortunately, there's no property to expand our current uh, uh, two cemeteries and there's really no other available land that I'm aware of that could be used for a cemetery with the exception of the 45 acre uh, west part of the old Tam O'Shanter golf course which is private and uh, I think that's going to be a common issue here in South Florida as population increases and uh, there's more undeveloped land and there's not very much left anyway and so right now once we are done with that there's nothing more I know several years not several years ago probably close to 15 years ago I believe um, Mr. Kendrick who is Parks and Recreation Director back then had brought forward a, an idea to the then City Commission about creating some mausoleums which would go vertical and add some more uh, spaces but that never really uh, made any headway with the then city commission and we certainly have not uh, reviewed doing that or bringing that forward but if that's something this commission would like for future consideration um, we can certainly take a look at seeing what the cost is and whether or not we're even able to do that on because that was 15 years ago I'm sure a lot of the land that was going to be set aside for that may have already been sold as uh, plots for um, the deceased. So, the yeah, I, I was yeah. glad to see that we have a, a space at uh, Pine View, for instance, yep. for cremains. Yep. I think that's what they call it. There's mm -hmm. a section that you have. And if we, I don't know if there are other pieces in that uh, area that we could even consider. Yep. But if we don't plan for that now or start yep. the planning for that now, you know, when, when we do, some of us want, want to be buried here. Yep. And, um, you know, we, we just need to take a look at that and see where we're going with it. Yeah, no problem. We'll certainly evaluate that and report back to the city commission. Um, I too would like to see that I know when we get the right the, the full budget we'll be able to take a look at where these numbers are but sure. um, we've, we've cut all, all the cuts that you're talking about are services that are providing um, and the increases are to personnel to me that seems pretty unbalanced so I would, I would like to sure. kind of have a better understanding of that um, as far as the fee increase I'm okay with us being where we're at um, uh, I, I think in some areas we need to look at it. One of the concerns I have with Sullivan Park is less about charging money to rent out the pavilion, is more that the people that are kind of going there and, and where we, they haven't made reservations and they show up and kind of take it over, is how they leave it and the condition they have. We have a little more control if we do charge a fee to say they've got to leave a deposit for any damages or anything like that. I've heard reports of uh, a lot of abuse over there by people that are, that are using that facility. So um, that would be the only way that we'd be kind of interested in that and figure out how we can get a better control of how they uh, limit the damages to that park because it, it is a prime, uh, it's a wonderful location. Um, I am, as far as the other fees, I'm, I'm not as inclined to look at that, but uh, um, I, I'm willing to look at it, but I'm not. Uh, my inclination is not to increase them, but unless proven that I'm wrong. Um, we have a park over in District 4 in River Glen area. Uh, River Glen, it's the pirate ship they have over there mm -hmm. in which the cover, the canvas cover, has been missing for quite a long mm -hmm. time. Is that in the budget to be replaced? It's, out, it's already been paid for. It just needs to be installed. Okay. It's, it was scheduled to actually get done, I think, yeah, about two weeks ago, and the weather threw them threw behind on the schedule. Yeah. It's already been ordered to pay for it. It has to be installed, and it should be any day. Okay, so that was in the, it's in the current budget. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, as far as the performance measures, um, employee training, uh, have, we, have we increased that or provided any more employee training? In terms of the funding? Uh, opportunity? Well, your goals for 17 and 18 were to provide employee training to encourage employee development. Are we continuing with that? Yes, we are. 
um, renovation of the playgrounds, you said you were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Do we have a departmental master plan highlighting prioritizing areas that need landscaping and irrigation improvements? It's about 90% complete. Okay. Uh, and enhance the overall landscape of the beach, ball fields, and parks? As part of the plan, yes. Okay. And improve customer service to residents through prompt response and communication with residents. I think you talked about with your survey, which would show as far as customer well, that's, satisfaction. That's, that's satisfaction with the programs and events. But, um, the, the response time we do is ours is 24 hour response. Okay. That's what we, we aim for. Um, improve customer service through enhanced ERP system to process uh, invoices and refunds more timely. Have we been able to accomplish that goal? Um, probably about 90%. Okay. Not quite a, not quite a hundred percent. Part, no. part of our challenge is that bills sometimes gets mailed to the, don't get come directly to us by the time we find them. Okay. But about 90% we're, get our bills and get them processed. Okay. Um, I think that's something we've done. That's okay. I think that's it.